and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, gang? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. And uh, ooh, we are packed today. Lots coming up on the Jets as they continue their road trip after a tough 4-1 loss to the Stars last night in Dallas. Jamie Thomas will jump on with us from Denver in about half an hour or so. And we'll also welcome in our good friend Marat Atesh and get his thoughts from uh, the first couple games of the season as well as look ahead to a back-to-backs on Wednesday and Thursday night against the Colorado Avalanche and the Vegas Golden Knights. And um, uh, lots of NFL news to get to. We'll uh, bring in Andy McNamara later on in the final half hour of the program to uh, catch up with Andy Mack, who was in the dog pound last weekend to see his Browns take another L. Uh, but the biggest story in town today is is a bomber story while they're on the bye week. And that is the extension to quarterback Zach Caleros. Ed Tate will join us in just a few minutes, right near the top of the program for the big news on uh, the bomber quarterback and CFL MOP inking an extension to stay here in the peg and continue pushing to do some incredible things for this blue bomber team who has won the last two Canadian football league championships. Uh, First off, big shout out to the uh, sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. We couldn't do it without them. Great thanks to Princess Auto, Cool Bet, Not Auto Corp, Consolidated Supply, Vita Health, Wallace & Wallace, uh, Royal Sports, Culligan Water, F Apparel, Boston Pizza, our friends at Little Brown Jug, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, and of course the great taste of Canadian Club Whiskey. Uh, let's get to it. Michael Remus, what's going on? How are you? I'm feeling great, Huss. Uh, you know, we can talk about the Jets' loss last night. We, although we have the Bombers with uh, making us forget about it with some great news. However, I'm still laughing uh, at the state of some of the Canadian teams last night. The Jets, Woo-hoo. Jets fans, are like what a this is game 84 of uh, last season, and you know, after last night, the Canucks blow their third consecutive uh, game with a lead. Players only meeting already. And the Leafs, uh, Leafs getting booed off the ice after two periods. They're down two to the Coyotes and ended up losing four two to the Coyotes. So a lot of Canadian teams two games in, fan bases fired up. Uh, this is so great. But uh, yeah, the Claire sign that was that was some positive news uh, to wake up to. I was pretty pumped to see that. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I mean, listen, the Bombers just keep on hitting home run after home run right now, and. Um, I will say this, and I don't know, maybe if you can, let's just get to it right now. The Bombers did put this out, and uh, they, <laughs> they did our pal Rod Peterson a little dirty, I think, with the <laughs> with the quote to start this off. Now, I will preface playing this clip by saying I'm glad they didn't have a clip of our program on the old station that was running live because I was on the air as it happened, and... To me, this was sort of an afterthought. I remember making the comment that, oh, well, if the uh, if the Bombers re-sign Zach Caleros and give up that first round pick to Toronto, that'll mean some amazing things had happened. But it didn't seem close to even a possible reality when Zach Caleros came in that trade deadline deal announced about an hour after the Canadian Football League trade deadline in 2019. All that being said, it has been nothing but magic ever since. Uh, but those of you that know Rod Peterson, of course, spent all those years in Saskatchewan, a great friend of the program. His his quote from the trade was used front and center by the Bombers when they uh, when they dropped it earlier today. This is this is the way it sounded for you on the podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, this was the video the Bombers put out to announce the re-signing of Caleros. I see people saying he can be an impact player. This is what the Bombers need. I've said it a million times. He hasn't been able to get onto the field. He hasn't thrown a pass in a game in a year. 
It's a nothing trade to me. Well, that was uh, that was a nice cold take. I had one. Rod had one. I think many of us had one. And and a big part of the concern was whether Zach Caleros would or should even continue playing football. Well, Zach's shown everyone that uh, if they doubted him, they were wrong. And the Bombers are the class of the Canadian football. They get 14 and three. So uh, I know Rod had something funny to say about that on his show today as well, a little earlier on. Um, so Ed Tate's going to join us in just a couple minutes. And we'll get to that. Uh, but Rima, let's quickly dive into last night's game. Um, I will say this. I think that, and I try it, with games now, I try not to spend too much time paying attention to social media during it. Obviously, it's great to interact with people. But um, I just find that, you know, often the overreaction and the narratives coming out of games can sometimes skew the way that you feel about what's happened because of you know what's everyone saying and often we hang out in echo chambers uh in uh, on social media so i didn't spend too much time on it but i did check out some of the post games afterwards and i was sort of surprised at how freaked out some people were about that game last night now listen the dallas stars were the better team they deserved to win but for people that were making that sound like it was just an absolute thrashing or something by the Dallas Stars, I mean, I didn't feel that way. I thought Jake Ottinger was really good. I thought a couple of the pucks that they put on net got through, you know, fortunately, a past Connor Hellebuck. And uh, a couple of the Jets' grade-A opportunities didn't go in the net. Now, I think the power play needed to be better last night. That was a big, big part of it, going 0 for 5 with the man advantage, um, which certainly put the team back a little bit. And, you know, certainly this was not a great game by the Winnipeg Jets, although I love the way they started. But I think this is a real test going up against a very good and very well-coached team with Peter DeBoer now behind the bench in the Dallas Stars. And, you know, <clears throat> I'll say this. I think that there are some lessons to be learned the hard way that it's going to have to be for this hockey club. Um, but I am interested to see how they fare in these next couple games on the road after that season opening win against the uh, against the Rangers. Certainly when you looked at, you know, the numbers, the shot share, high danger scoring chances, this was not a completely lopsided game last night. So um, I don't know. I sort of took issue with some of the people that were had sky is falling takes after uh, after one loss on the season. Yeah, I tend to be pretty even keeled and I am looking at natural stat trick at five on five. High danger scoring chances were 9-8 for the Jets. I think maybe people have, you know, you want to overreact. Maybe you have some concerns like, um, you know, the top line is the only line on this team that can score. They have, you know, it's been two games. You haven't had a goal from the second line. The power plays kind of been, you know, back to being stagnant again and not moving the puck quickly. And that's something Scott Arneal mentioned. Losing to Dallas again, just bringing me flashbacks of overtime loss after overtime <laughs> loss last year to I would have taken overtime last night considering yeah. the way things ended they, up in the second half of the game. They got off to a hot start. I mean, I almost fell out of my seat there on that Mark Shifley shot. Um, that was the highlight of the game, and then it kind of went a bit a bit downhill. But Kyle Connor entering the zone with speed, pushing back on the defenders, stopping. You know, quick little... It seemed like a harmless dish to Shifley, who was... Who was ready for it and just rocketed that puck top corner? What a shot! It, it was incredible. <laughs> uh, that was that was awesome, and unfortunately, you didn't get to uh, too much more of that. You know, a couple of penalties uh, the Jets took, which maybe you'd like like to have back. And there was the special teams. Jets 0 for five on the power play, and Dallas was one for four. And you know, a couple of Dallas's goals, just uh, Hawk and Paw. The you know the go ahead goal was, uh, you know, just a point shot in, in traffic, and it go gets through. Sorry, I think it tipped off Dylan's That was the one skate. off Dylan's, yeah, off Dylan's and, leg or whatever. But the tying goal in the first, uh, Tyler Sagan, all, you know, all alone in front. Um, that's something you don't want to see, a guy like him. And, I mean, how does he do this every time, Sagan, <laughs> against the Jets? You know, I thought Sagan has had all these injuries. He's had, you know, sur he's recovered from surgery last year he's not a top player anymore but it seems like whenever he plays the jets uh he <laughs> puts up a lot of points on us it's uh i think him and ovechkin are the two biggest jet killers of the last 10 years so shout out to tyler sagan who's just giving jets nightmares over and over again i gotta bring up those numbers 
Yeah, no, listen, Sagan uh, always licks his chops when he's playing against the Winnipeg Jets. And listen, he was very opportunistic. That was sort of a weird play where, uh, you know, the puck, you know, a couple of the defensemen somewhat banged into each other a little bit out of position. And uh, it didn't take long for that puck to find Tyler Sagan and get to the back of the net, um, which was unfortunate because I thought at that point the Jets had really, I mean, they had a great start to the game. I mean, the first 10 minutes was really carried by Winnipeg. And you know, as much as we just, you know, I think a lot of fans look at that and say, okay, great. Well, this is much better than that, this team, and they're going to do that for 60 minutes. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And, you know, we did see a big bounce back from the Dallas Stars. And there was a period, and I always said kind of overall the shots and high danger scoring chances were somewhat even. I think there was a little bit of score effects in the third period when the Jets had those power plays and, you know, Dallas had that comfortable three-goal lead. Um but there was a period of a good 25 minutes where the Jets did not have a lot going in and around uh, Jake Ottinger. Um, all that being said, this is uh, one game of 82 right now, one and one on the season, and we'll check in with the uh, we'll check in with Jamie Thomas in a few minutes. Let's quickly hear what Scott Arneal had to say. Um, of course, Scott, the associate head coach, but taking over as head coach for the first couple games of the season while. Bones gets back on the uh, on the horse after dealing with COVID. Um, Arneel talked a little bit about uh, his thoughts on the game last night for his Winnipeg Jets post game in Dallas. Well, you know what they uh, they're a quick team as well, and they really did a real good job of slowing us down through the neutral zone. Kind of took away our forecheck, whether they took it away or we didn't get. Um, we didn't get our second guy in there as quick. We weren't really a five-man forecheck like we had been in the first, like we had in the past. And, um, you know, we got back on our heels, and they were coming with speed at us uh, more in that second and third than we were going after them. Is that what you need more of? Just like, like what was missing tonight that maybe was there on Friday? Uh, probably that, that. That was a real grit game. You know, they came out, they banged us. You know, they blocked some shots. Uh, they won some wall battles. Probably a little bit more of that that we need to do. Um, you know, you're not going to play a soft, cute game in our division. It's going to be, you know, divisional opponents going to have to play them hard. And I thought that uh, they they won a few more battles than than we did. Third assessment from uh, Jets acting head coach last night, Scott Arneal, after the 4-1 loss in Dallas. Um, we mentioned special teams were a factor. Dallas was able to score on the power play. The Jets weren't. And, um, of course, Dallas did, uh, and the Jets went 0 for 5 on the P on the PP. Here's what uh, Arneal had to say about the special teams battle in the game. Well, they tried to keep us the outside. You know, one thing, you know, I think when we move the puck quick, um, you know, there's a tendency to open up lanes. You know, sometimes we held on to it. They were aggressive. and um, But at the end of the day, if you move it quick, and hopefully you're catching somebody out of position, you're getting some good looks. Yeah, that was one thing I'll say, and I think this comes down to, um, you know, DeBoer and his staff doing a pretty good job of, of reading, going into the game, how the Jets' power play was set up and how it was working. Um, you know, there's a couple times when the past second power play unit was out there and Cole Perfetti was on, uh, where got the puck, had a good lane, and it seemed like they almost knew where it was coming before it got there. And that, you know, really kept it to the outside, which is exactly what you want to be doing. Um, and that'll be something I'm sure the Winnipeg Jets will be working on going forward. One other factor in the game um, was Dallas, you know, getting busy in front of Connor Hellebuck last night. And Arneal addressed uh, Dallas's net front presence last night. I mean, they, you know, whether it's five on five, they have some real good people that have good sticks. Their D gets some pucks down there. But, you know, that first period even, there was some real, they got some real good looks. Our whole, you know, premise of our D zone coverage is protecting the guts of the ice. And, we let people get in there alone. We let them get some pretty good looks. The Sagan goal was us kind of looking around and not finding the, mo the most dangerous guy. And, you know, when we're on our game, we're, we're doing a good job between the dots and our end of the rink. And tonight, we were a little bit soft in that area. All right, so there's a little bit more from, uh, from Coach uh, Arneal last night. We'll check in with the Winnipeg Jets in 15 or so with Jamie Thomas in Denver and uh, get the latest on Rick Bonus, who I think best case scenario will join the club tomorrow and be on the bench for the game against the Colorado Avalanche. We'll also talk about what lineup changes we might see uh, with Murata Tesh coming up a little bit later on in the program. Uh, why not question of the day is 
Give us your thoughts on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers inking the quarterback of the two-time defending champs today, which we'll talk about with Ed Tate right now. Hit us up in the comments. Your thoughts on uh, what this means for the Bombers through 2025, trying to do something that no team has done since the early 80s. Of course, the why not question of the day brought to you by our friends at Not Auto Corp, Waverly and McGilvery, and online at not.ca. Just before we bring in Eddie Tate, a big shout out to our friends at Consolidated Supply. Zach Caleros might want to head down to Consolidated Supply. He's got a couple extra, uh, couple extra bills in the wallet, maybe. Set up shop here in Winnipeg. Get a beautiful artificial putting green in the backyard. Crank out a hot tub. Maybe a great outdoor kitchen. And uh, certainly, as the golf course experts for so many years in Winnipeg, Consolidated Supply can help Zach maybe with the uh, beautiful green lawn next year. Or, as I mentioned, artificial turf uh, as well. Uh, run by great guys, WST listeners. If you've got needs when it comes to irrigation, artificial turf, or uh, working on that dream backyard, cte.ca is the website. Pop down and see Spicy Joe and the gang at 1395 Niagara Road East, or you can give them a call at 470-3832. Um, hey, if you're looking for great prices on natural and organic, organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, and Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products, you need to be shopping at any one of the seven Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. With back to school here, people getting sick, Vita Health is also a spot for great school friendly snacks and lunch items and a great immunity products like vitamin C and D. And they've always got delicious and healthy options for you at the grab and go deli like Vita Market soups, salads, sandwiches, and more. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives, seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. And hey, our friends at Wallace and Wallace have been around for decades as the fencing experts in town. You've seen their fences and trucks all around the city. What you might not know is they're also a leader in overhead doors. And if you're thinking about either maintenance, repair, or a brand new garage door, talk to our friends at Wallace & Wallace who work with Clopay, the largest garage door manufacturer in the world with 161 different styles of garage doors. There is definitely one that's right for your home. And a new garage door can add up to 4% to the value of said home as well. Pop down and see them at their showroom on Lawson Road or find out more online at wallacedoors.com. All right, big news today. We will get back to the Jets as they continue their road trip, but we all woke up this morning with some great news from the Winnipeg Football Club that Zach is back until 2025. The Blue Bomber Grey Cup winning quarterback and CFL MOP inks a three-year extension at Ed Tate from BlueBombers.com joins us now to talk about it. Eddie, what's up? How are you? Pretty good, huh? Not too bad. How are you, man? I'm awesome. I was very delighted by the news this morning. I imagine there was a lot of smiles around Palmer HQ as well with the announcement of Zach's new deal. Yeah, this uh, this is a big one, right? There's no way to undersell this one. It's it's big for the club. It's big for him. Um, you know, I was just thinking about this league has been, you know, so much player movement in the offseason in the last few years. And to get your quarterback, at, you know, signed up, for three more years, the most outstanding player last year, probably again this year. Uh, it's pretty massive. You just look around the league, right? I mean, Nathan Rourke's been amazing in BC, but he might get NFL interest. Taylor Cornelius is in Edmonton. We're not sure about him. Jake Mayer, the Bo Levi Mitchell, where's he going to go? Cody Fajardo might be getting run out of Regina. Who knows in Hamilton with Dane Evans, Jeremiah Mazzoli, Nick Arbuckle in Ottawa, Trevor Harris, McLeod. I mean, it's just, it's stability at the most important situ uh, position on the on the depth chart, and for a club that's uh, you know chasing a third straight uh, Grey Cup and hopes to host a Grey Cup in a couple of years, getting this guy locked down is massive. Well, it certainly is, and there's still lots of work left to be done this year. But, and I have stayed away. I've still not said the D word until maybe another Grey Cup is won. Um, but we all know that in a lot of ways, the, the groundwork was laid in the years before, but everything changed when Zach Caleros came here in 2019. And we still talk about that what was essentially a meaningful pass at the end of that regular season game against the Calgary Stampeders to Darvin Adams 
that I think opened up everybody's eyes as what the Bombers were getting in Zach Caleros. And it's been magic ever since. I mean, the numbers and the wins speak for themselves, not to mention the championships. And we've got a very good chance to do that again this year. Ed, I have to ask you, what can you tell us about uh, about the deal itself and um, how it came to be um, got done at this point going into the bye week still with some uh, work left to do this season? Yeah, we just finished a session with Kyle Walters a few minutes ago, Huss, and uh, he said, I guess the conversation started probably late August, early September. Um, Zach said he didn't want to go anywhere else. Um, he's getting a bump. He's already the highest paid player in the league. He's getting a bump um, in the salary cap's going to go up next year. And part of the new clause that uh, he'll have some more guaranteed money than, than he might have in the last couple contracts because of what was going on with COVID and that sort of thing. And organizations not having a lot of money in their bank account to be giving guys off season bonuses. So he'll have a, a, a portion of this guaranteed. Um, but I don't think it took very long because uh, the bombers wanted him back. He wanted to be back. Um, and uh, so I think uh, Zach said that uh, his agent came to him with some numbers and signed off on it. And it, I, I don't think it was too complicated. You know, there's no sense uh, making it sound like it was this long drawn out thing that when both sides want to get something done, sometimes it can happen pretty quickly. Well, I, I think there's so many benefits to this. I mean, from a team perspective, knowing, and you mentioned the word stability, and that is not the case almost anywhere else in the Canadian Football League. And I think the stability from top to bottom of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers is part of the reason why we're, again, talking about tickets being on sale for the West Final or potential two wins away from another championship. But this is more than that to me, Ed, in that, you know, moving ahead and beyond this year, Having that guy, the guy there for three years, I think really helps out Kyle Walters when it comes to player retention, player attraction. And I know we haven't talked a lot about Mike O'Shea and Mike O'Shea's contract situation, but I mean, he would naturally be in incredible demand with the job that he's done here in Winnipeg. Knowing that he's got his guy here for three years, I think probably helps uh you know, maybe when it comes to keeping the band together uh, beyond this season as well, not just involving the players on the field. Right. There's some a lot of layers to this. There's a lot of potential impact to this. And, uh, you know, when you talk about keeping the band together, um, nobody wants to leave when you're pumping out all these hit records, right? And I think <laughs> that's the situation with Winnipeg right now uh, from the top down. And it, it is continuity. And you may, just to to go off on a tangent here a little bit, us, you uh, referenced a couple of minutes ago about when the trade happened in 2019 and that amazing throw to Darvin Adams in his first start. I'll be honest, I was one of those guys that when the trade was made, uh, you know, Chris Trebler was the starting quarterback at the time because Matt Nichols was hurt. I thought, well, that's an interesting pickup. You know, here's a guy with experience uh, that can, you know, get some stuff done for this club. Um but I didn't think it would morph into what it has. I don't think anybody did. I'm not sure that Zach thought beyond uh, that that fall that where he would be back in Winnipeg. Uh, and so for it to get to where it is, where a guy's 31 and four and won two great cups, it's just <laughs> sometimes, it's just it's just funny how fate works sometimes, right? Because at the time it had kind of a temporary feel to it, and now we're talking about a guy that if he keeps trending this way, will be a hang, his name will be up in the Ring of Honor. I mean, think of that. A last-minute trade just before the close of the trading deadline, and, and he, this guy might be considered one of the all-time best in this franchise's history. Well, I mean, just speaking of that, I mean, I think there's probably a handful of guys right now that if they walked out the door right now without playing another down for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers would be ending up in the ring of honor. I think with what Zach's done so far, he's partly, partly in that group. But you're exactly right. I mean... I was telling the story, and I know you guys had some fun doing Rod a little dirty with the quote uh, that was released on there. But listen, I said right off the top of the show, I'm glad they didn't have my quote from being on uh, the other station when it happened. I was like, oh, well, oh, this is an interesting insurance move. And I almost well, joked at the possibility of the Bombers giving up that first-round pick because they'd re-signed Zach Caleros kind of tongue-in-cheek saying, well, something really amazing would have happened. Well, that's exactly what did happen and has continued to happen ever since. And, you know, we go back to that day 
that trade and what Zach Caleros has done with this Winnipeg Blue Bomber team that, as you mentioned, the foundation had been built. He took them over the finish line to the promised land. It's truly one of the greatest stories, CFL history, bomber history. Um, you know, it's one of those fairy tales that doesn't usually happen the way that it has. And there's just chapter after chapter right now. And looks like we're going to have a few more years of chapters with number eight behind center. Yeah. You know, uh, his impact's been amazing and you're right. It, it might go down as the greatest trade in CFL history. And um, <clears throat> you were, before I went off on my little tangent, Huss, you were talking about his impact and the impact of this signing. One of the things that I've noticed, and if you're around him every day at practice or in the building here, I don't think his quiet leadership gets enough uh, credit either. You know, so his numbers are his numbers. His success is right there. He's you know already had career numbers this year and passing yards, and he's got the third highest tied for the third highest most uh, touchdown passes in Bombers single season history. So those are, are, are right there in the black and white, but it's his leadership and, and sort of the tone he sets around here that uh, is maybe un, unappreciated from outside these walls. It's uh, he's just got a quiet fire about him that uh, is contagious guys uh, uh, rally to him. Uh, you know, I think that Drew Brown played really well in uh, BC on the weekend, except for those two mistakes. But don't think for a second that uh, Zach Caleros doesn't have a part of that too, because that guy's in the quarterback room with him every day and learning from a guy like him and Dakota Prukop and, and Buck Pierce, the offensive coordinator, but Zach's fingerprints are more and more on this organization with every day than they were. You remember again, back in 2019, one start in the regular season, that magical run through the playoffs, but this was a guy that was still living in a hotel near the stadium here. Now he feels more like a part of this team. He is more a part of this team, and his influence is felt everywhere. You know, I think of Zach on the offensive side, similarly to, well, someone like Willie Jefferson, in that, you know, made an absolutely massive impact, has been a huge part of winning, and has become a real culture carrier for the team. And, of course, Willie and his wonderful family now making Winnipeg home. Um and you know, we'll see what, you know, maybe this changes Zach's um, situation and being poor part of the community for 12 months a year. Um, but the bottom line is on both sides of the football, um, there's just simply no comparison to what the Boo Bombers have built and what they have right now compared to the rest of the league. And this almost ups it, Ed, moving into, you know, 23 and 24 and 25, when maybe we will be talking about that D word, depending on what happens this year. Um all that being said, Ed, just bringing it back to right now, I mean, I don't think this changes anything for this season. Everyone knows what the goal is. Zach is the guy. Um, I have to ask you a football question. Any idea as to how Mike O'Shea and the coaching staff is going to handle this very kind of weird schedule with a bye week, the final game of the season against the BC Lions, another bye week, and then the game that means everything, the West Final to get to the Grey Cup for a player like Zach Caleros. I mean, do you want to keep him off the field for a month? I kind of doubt it. I mean, uh, will he play a half like happened before? I mean, do you have any inkling on how Mike O'Shea is going to handle his roster and the key players, many of which who sat out last week in BC? You know, Huss, I wish I, wish I could give you some inside knowledge here. I don't have any. Like, I'll be quite honest. Look, uh, um, I think there's a template that was set last year and how they handled their roster in those last two games before the playoffs. Um, the other component that's different a bit this year is you've got one more regular season games. And if you can get uh, players like Greg Ellingson and Drew Olatarski back on the practice field uh, on the weekend or next week, leading into that game, they're going to need live snaps. So maybe guys like that get some, some more work. I'm not sure about Zach and how much he would play, if at all, but do you want him to go that long between real snaps, right? He, he dressed for the game in Vancouver, but didn't uh, play. So, you know, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he got, you know, a series or two in the in the first quarter. But, you know, with every decision you make like that comes some risk, too. And so would you rather have a guy have some rust for November 13th in the Western final or be on the disabled list? So those are things that's going to be position by position, player by player, I think as the team heads into its last regular season. Oh, you know what's funny? I was thinking about the blueprint last year. 
And then I remember they turned the football over five times in the first half against the Riders in the West right. Finals. So maybe they maybe go a little bit of a different route this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know what? The end result was a W, but you're right. You could easily make that uh, analogy that uh, maybe there was a little bit too much rust, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that there's a magic formula here, Huss. I, again, I think it's going to be just a, a feel thing for Coach O'Shea. And, you know, he trusts his veterans so much if – if he uh, asked Stanley Bryant, do you need this week? And he said, no, uh, then you'd say, okay, you take the day off. Um, th- there's a lot of guys like that that on this team that have earned th- that kind of uh, um, leeway with the coach. So we'll see. The, the depth chart that comes out uh, next week is going to be fascinating. No doubt. For all uh, just those quickly reasons. before we roll, um, uh, what's going on? I mean, obviously, uh, Kyle Walters has been working. Zach Caleros grabbed a pen. Um, most of the players just completely off this week. I. No, Mike O'Shea maybe wouldn't have mind seeing a few guys. He was uncharacteristically very pissed after that loss, despite all the guys that had sat out. Hey, he wasn't specific about what the schedule was. Uh, like, there's lots of guys in here today, Huss. I mean, the playoffs are, are approaching. This is different than a bye week in the summer or early September. These guys know what's going on. They know what the work they've got to do to get ready for this thing. So... Um, I don't think there's anybody that's really jetted out of town here or um, is putting their feet up and not getting into the gym at all. This bunch is all fixated on November 13th right now and then hopefully a week well, after listen, that too. Well, uh, listen, huge day for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, the fan base, the city. Zach Calero's back with a three-year extension through 2025. Bring on the playoffs and uh, let's get ready for the 13th of November and fill that stadium. Ed, thanks so much. Uh, say what's up to the gang back at HQ. Thanks for Appreciate having me on, it. Huss, There's and Eddie Tate and more coverage on the Caleros extension at bluebombers.com. All right, we're going to get to the Jets right now. Jamie Thomas about to join us from Denver, Colorado, where the Jets will be taking on the Avalanche tomorrow. Uh, before we do that, a big thanks to our friends at Not Auto Corp. Again, getting your comments in in the comments of the YouTube channel on the extension of Zach Caleros. What does this mean for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers going forward? That's the why not question of the day. Of course, not Autocorp, great sponsor of ours, and the Tesla leaders in Manitoba. If you've been thinking about potentially making a switch over to the electric vehicles, talk to the experts at Not about their Tesla Experience program, which includes overnight or weekend-long Tesla experiences and an opportunity to learn about electric vehicles and technology from the Tesla experts. Tesla payments begin from $4.99 by, by weekly and no gas expenses. And of course, they've got everything else there too. And we talk a lot about the vehicles and why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price at Not Auto Corp. You might not know they've got the Winnipeg Car Lab, which has custom commercial graphics and vinyl wraps for your vehicles, boats, quads, sleds, and more. A 3M certified 20-year experience master installer on the squad as well. And of course, with winter coming, why not get safe winter tires now and pay later with winter tire specials and the MPI payment plan? It's all there at Not Auto Corp, Waverly, and McGilvery. Check them out online over at not.ca. Well, I can't tell you that our friends at Royal Sports are busy, busy right now. Hockey is back, and they are the hockey superstore family owned for over 40 years. And I know with the Bombers getting ready for another push to the Grey Cup and the Jets back on the ice, fans flocking in as well to uh, get their fan gear for the upcoming season and the playoff push. But it's much more than just Jets and Bombers. All National Hockey League, NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA, and an incredible selection of Canada soccer gear just in time for our return to the World Cup. Pop down and check it all out at the Superstore Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway, and on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina. Give them a follow for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And uh, I guess after our big show at the rink on Friday, we got to plan another suit show after you guys came through with all that great support. Well, we certainly are ready to go with the suits from our friends at F Apparel. If you gentlemen are looking to upgrade your wardrobe, no other place to go than see Andrew and the gang down at F. Uh, Custom suits beginning at $400. A great buy one, get one 30% off deal right now for suits for those of you that wear them regularly or need a bit of a wardrobe refresh. And for those of you that are involved in a wedding party for next year, Talk to the gang at F right now. If you book and get fitted by the end of November, 
a 10% discount for the entire squad and a free shirt for everybody in the wedding party, savings of up to $130 per person. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown. Check them out online or make an appointment at F. That's EPHapparel.com. All right, let's uh, get out to Denver right now and get ready for the Jets to continue their road trip against the mighty Stanley Cup champion Avalanche with our guy, Jamie Thomas. JT, what's up? How are you? I was, I'm was. i just happy I made my bed for this situation. I, I, as I look over my shoulder, I'm like, whew, the bed this is made. Presidential <laughs> suite for the, yeah. uh, for the guy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, 20th floor, you know how it goes. I just I said, listen, I cannot be on any floor lower than Edmonds. That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> so they slapped me up higher than him. So <laughs> Hey, you, you know what? I want to talk to you about the game last night and look yep. ahead. But um, but first things first, um, how's Bones? What do we know about the coach? Uh what a brutal way for the season to start. I mean, we had such a great day down doing the show, having Sarah on and getting ready uh, live from the rink. And we were just packing our stuff out to go do a quick drop off before coming back for the game. And we got the news that um, Rick Bonus had tested positive for COVID. Uh, sounds like he's been doing quite well, but what's the latest on him? And do you, uh, do you expect that he might be behind the bench tomorrow for the first time this season in his return to the Winnipeg Jets? Uh, uh, the, the best case scenario was Huss was that he was going to board a plane and get here today. So I'm just waiting word to see if he is indeed going to be here. And it, it's the way everything ran so smoothly through training camp and through the preseason, they go four, one and one, get the home opener. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, come on. Like just when that news came out, I was just like, is this the way this is going to go after everything ran so smoothly? And I'm like, why can't we have nice things? Uh, all that stuff. But, uh, Scott O'Neill and the rest of the coaching staff did a great job. Friday in the home opener. So uh, we'll, I'm waiting to, if I get a word here, I'll let you know right away what the situation is with, uh, with Rick bonus, but it's unfortunate, right? He, he was so excited to coach in the home opener, his return to Winnipeg. I know he had coached in the, in the preseason and then the, the game last night in Dallas would have been great for him to come back. And it was really nice to hear all the n- nice words that Pete DeBoer had following up Rick bonus, the players, Dallas Stars uh, speaking so highly of Rick Bonus too, so it's unfortunate that he was un- unable to uh, coach there last night. But the Jets will be back here in, in later November to, uh, or sorry, back in Dallas for him to have that opportunity to make his return. Well, no doubt. I mean, just going back to Friday a little bit. I mean, you no know, Rick, you know, met the media and uh, you know had a great presser before uh, before the game, and you could tell he was a little under the weather and his voice was going at the end, but. I was joking to Remus. I'm like, well, yeah, that's because he's been barking orders at the guys, filling them in on uh, the new way things are working around here. And yeah. unfortunately, that was not the case. But just uh, by all accounts, from what you're hearing, I mean, he's doing well. I mean, this is um, it, his expected return will be relatively soon. Um, no complications or no real concerns about where the no. coach is at right now. No, no, he's he's totally he's getting better. And um, I mean, it's I was the same as you. OK, so I've, I've just got confirmation plan is for him to travel tomorrow and be good for the game. So he will indeed be uh behind the bench tomorrow night against the Colorado Avalanche. So uh, well, that is the great news. That absolutely is great news. And thanks for that. And uh, no I imagine as much as it sucks to, uh, to get COVID and, you know, deal with being sick for a few days, what mm-hmm. was probably really killing Rick bonus was not to be on the bench for that big win for his team last night. And that return to Dallas uh, yesterday started off very well Friday mm-hmm. night against the New York Rangers. Um, you know, a typical, another good start for the team last night. I thought. Yes. I mean, especially the first ten minutes of the uh, the game, they got the they got the lead going on. Um, and then, you know, to Dallas's credit, I thought they really tightened up and made it difficult for the Jets to do what they wanted to do for a good stretch of about twenty to twenty five minutes. Um, and then got a couple breaks with goals went in. How did you see that one go from a Jets perspective last night, Jamie? Uh, I, I'm with you, Huss. Like a, the great opening ten minutes. And, it, and it's so easy to go. I think a lot of the habits that we were there last year kind of crept in last night against Dallas. And, and before we start beating on the Jets, I'm with you. Like, I think we have to give a lot more credit to Dallas than people have been giving. I watched the two games against Nashville, and they are on you. Like, the time and space that the Jets had for the first and second, third periods against the Rangers was not there at all last night. Maybe early on the Jets had their their, their, their legs underneath them. But Dallas took that away. They're no longer a one-line team. They're deep on the back end. And Jake Ottinger, like, 
it was a Howard serve, a one timer from Mark Scheifele that got past him, and he was everywhere. Like there was no rebounds to be found. And then that one redirect by Scheifele on the power play that went off the post. You know, like the, the physics behind it, it was just the way the night went for the Jets. It, it rolled on its side and then curled away from the goal line. So there, there's a lot of reasons why things didn't go well. I think first, it's how well Dallas is playing in their system, but just a lot of the little habits with the Jets giving pucks away in, in the neutral zone, silly penalties in the offensive end of the ice kind of played into what Dallas was doing. And um, so full credit to Dallas and, and a learning lesson, which was the consistent message you heard from Adam Lowry, um, Josh Morrissey, and uh, associate coach Scott Arneal last night after the game. Yeah, and you know, and and listen, I mean, a lot of these guys are veterans. They've been mm-hmm. in these situations before. They know what's up. Um, you know, for some of the newer players or younger players, like a Cole Perfetti that's getting an opportunity to play in a very significant role against, you know, these are the teams. And this and Scott talked about it after the game. Um, yeah. You know, through games like this, you learn a few hard lessons, especially for some of the younger players on the club. And um. You know what? It's not always easy. Sometimes the Jets make can make it look easy when things are really going well and they're playing with that speed. Uh, it really did seem like the Dallas Stars, after that great start by the Jets, did everything they could to take them out of their rhythm, to not give them very much time with the puck for decision-making and have a tough time to get the speed going in the first place. And um, And then... Once you sort of have that equalizer of the game, then it's going to mm-hmm. come down to getting pucks on net, getting traffic in front of goaltenders. And that was something I think Dallas did particularly well in the second period and early third that sort of flipped the game. Yeah. And I, and I thought the start of the second period, Hustle, like the Jets were much better. Like they were not very good for the entire second period against the Rangers. But then, as you said, they just kind of, Dallas just, whatever speed the Jets had going through the neutral zone, it was gone. It was, they took that away. And, you're starting to trying to manufacture offense and that leads to problems and pucks coming back the other way. And I even think of the first goal, like Tyler Sagan was in the slot behind and then he sneaks in front. The jets weren't giving that up against the Rangers. Yes. They gave up 41 shots, but those kind of easy plays in tight weren't, weren't there. And uh, again, we got to give some credit to Dallas, but some blame has to be played on the defensive structure or the defensive play in their own end. Uh, against the Dallas Stars so lots of things that they know they have to tighten up it gets a little bit harder tomorrow night against the Colorado Avalanche let's uh, this has been a a place of horrors I've been here for one win I think it was on New Year's Eve it was a 6-5 overtime win if my memory serves me correctly so it hasn't been easy for the Jets against this team but that being said you know the addition of Rick Bonus behind the bench tomorrow and then you know maybe a little more attention paid to details that have to be that have to be done against a team like the Colorado Avalanche and you have a better result uh, tomorrow night. Jamie Thomas of uh, Jets TV joining us live from Denver where the Jets will be taking on the Stanley Cup champion Avalanche tomorrow. And, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, the Rangers were a great test early on. I mean, obviously maybe a little bit benefiting from a busy schedule for them going into the Jets home opener. We've talked about this Dallas game. Um, but when, it talk, when you talk the Central Division, Jamie, and yeah. you talk about the league overall, um, no better way to test where you're at right out of the gate than going up against the team that uh, had a ring ceremony a couple weeks ago. Yeah, they 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 like. I you look around the division. Okay, you feel bad about you lose that game last night, but how about Minnesota? Like Minnesota can't keep the puck out of their own and their own net there. And then you know it is Saint like going to Excel Energy Center. It is hard to win there, and lots of teams have gone in there and won. So you, all you have to do is look around the league right now, and if you feel bad about where you are, and after one game, okay, I get it, but there's some struggling going on. But Colorado, just we're, we're opportunistic. Uh, Minnesota, for whatever reason, is not getting great goaltending. So that's going to play into, like Connor Hellebuck played well last night, but there was traffic in front of him. I remember that Hockenpah goal. That, there was just, Logan Stanley got in it. You could just tell the way, Hellebuck was looking around trying to find the puck, and then it, next thing you know, it's behind him. So they got to clean that part up as, you know, box players out in front of Hellebuck, try and get it, make sure he can see that puck to make that first save. And Colorado, getting into penalty problems is probably not the right thing to do. And I felt for the most part, the Jets didn't get, you know, there was that Pierre Luc Dubois penalty that I didn't really like in the offensive end, but they didn't run into penalty problems. They had lots of power play opportunities. So there's just, there's little, 
kinks here and there, the game that I got to work out. But Colorado is mm-hmm. is as a juggernaut. They don't have Gabriel Landeskog right now. But you just got to go down the list. Kale McCarr. Uh, I don't have to go into what they have going on here. And just I, I remember last year the Jets being down, up three nothing after one period. And if Colorado just gets one goal, then the, then they just they just keep coming at you. So it's important that they stay within the structure of their game and not turn things over and allow Colorado any type of momentum because they they feast on that type of stuff. And we just can't overly state that enough about playing against them. But I I, I don't feel the Jets are going in there t- tomorrow night and feeling overwhelmed about what they have. They know what they have to do. It's just like they're a veteran team. They understand what they have to do. They're they're coming off a tough loss, but let's move on and get into them and focus on this one. Well, and you know what, you got to keep your composure in Denver yes. as well. I mean, 100%. you know, there there is no team and no building where it seems like things can just snowball on you quickly, and that's part of the reason why they're the Stanley Cup champions. I mean, they have yes. that offensive horsepower, and it seems like there's sharks in the water when they smell blood. Uh, yeah. And we've seen that, unfortunately, on the wrong side of things for the Jets over the years. But it will be interesting. As far as the lineup goes, um, I know Rick Bonus had said that, you know, early on in the season, there would be some guys going in, going out. Do you think we might see one of the two defensemen that have not played so far this season? And uh, uh, potentially even Axel Janssen Fjallby, who hasn't yet to make his Jets debut. Yeah, I thought like because Rick Bonus had mentioned about Janssen Fjallby playing even on Monday, and and that didn't happen. So and it, the easiest time to make changes has is when after a loss. So uh, maybe that that there's a little change in that. I I still think the fourth line uh, was pretty effective in the, just under nine, you know, eight nine minutes. Maybe not the you know the wonderful game winning goal that they have, and uh, that you're not going to have that every night. And you know I. I think maybe there and maybe Dylan Sandberg, right? This is this could be an opportunity here for him to come in on, on that third defense pairing. So that remains to be seen. That then the oh, the morning skate will be absolutely fascinating at Ball Arena to see how that's going to work out. But um, it was I, you know, you look. I think maybe Logan Stanley had a tough night. Do you make the change? But that's the reason why you have eight defensemen is so, uh, when you have these opportunities to present themselves like that. But uh, tough a tough way for Dylan Sandberg to come into the lineup against the defending Stanley Cup champion, uh, Colorado Avalanche, but he's 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 faced these types of teams before and uh, will relish the opportunity to get back in the lineup should that happen. But, yeah, it's it's going to be fascinating to see if they tinker at all. And before we move on, Huss, I, like, I was talking to David Gustafson yesterday in the dressing room quickly, and here's a guy that maybe this is kind of like the breath of fresh air that you have with a guy like David Gustafson. He's had a tough time staying healthy. This year he starts – in the NHL, but I was talking with him and he goes, you know, I had the best, that was the most fun I've ever had in my time in hockey in that game against the Avalanche, you go, or sorry, against the Rangers. Like we were contributing and that I had a big smile on my face going on the bench. So, and then I had asked him about, you know, how much have you working on face-offs? He goes, he, he goes like, there's no excuse not to be ready in the National Hockey League because every time you come back to the bench, there's another video. So uh, just the the breath of fresh air of a guy that loves being in the National Hockey League and appreciates the grind to get there is David Gustafson. So just a just a small happy note to pass your way. Hey, coming off of, you know what, in, Gus? In Gus is. Um... He's just a pleasure to be around, a pleasure yeah. to talk to. And 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 that is some of that, you know, youthful energy, excitement, exuberance that I think will be a real nice addition to this group who, you know, has had some changes, but many holdovers from a year, a disappointing season last year. And I'll right. say this, I mean, we've heard a lot from Rick Bonus and Scott Arneal that this needs to be a four-line team. And yeah. uh, you know, through two games, and again, small sample size, I get it, but I mean, to get your first point on the winning goal in the home opener with Sam Gagne being a newbie. And as I said, I thought they acquitted themselves well. And I've yeah. been particularly impressed with Gustafson and Menelainen on the PK so far this yes. year. So, yes. I mean, these are important things. And yeah, there'll be some wins and losses early on in the season. But as they try to form the identity of what Rick Bonus wants, that fourth line's a big part of it. And I personally have been... Um, quite enthused about what I've seen from that group. And I think they're worthy of, you know, some more minutes or more minutes than the fourth line had traditionally got over the last few years here in Winnipeg. Right. And, and another thing too, is like the PK let's, let's find another here. The PK has been really good and they gave up that goal. That was, there was back-to-back penalties there, but let's not kid ourselves. Dallas is a great power play. They acquitted themselves why against the Rangers. So at, at some point you're going to give up goals while shorthanded, 
But the point is, is they're not giving up those those seam passes. It hasn't been easy for the opposition to generate offense while on the power play. So I think there's some good signs here. And that was one of the focuses in training camp is to get the PK in a good place right now. And I and I think it is. We don't want to see a parade at the penalty box to keep testing the penalty kill. But for right now and through two games, I think the penalty kill has been one of the consistent positive things going on with this team right now. Well, and Jamie, while we're talking about the bottom six, and I think you yeah. know, we kind of focused on Mendeline and the new guy and how's Gustafson done and Sam Gagne with the winning goal. I got to say, he hasn't been on the scoreboard yet, but Morgan Barron has been yes. impactful in both of these games. He's had some real legitimate, great scoring chances. And if, if you can continue to put yourself in that position, uh, they're going to come. And that is going to be, you know, how that third line does against top competition, but also if they can start chipping in themselves, that's a huge part of success for this team where I'm coming from. Right. And you have three, like Mason Appleton is just thrilled to be back in Winnipeg, right? The, the, it's, it was unfortunate that he had to go to Seattle. Somebody had to go in the expansion draft, but there is nobody happy to be back in Winnipeg, I think, than Mason Appleton right now. So that, that line can grind teams down in the right situation. I think they, they were the most consistent uh, line, in my opinion, against the Dallas Stars last night. And I think we're going to be saying that more times than not uh, as the season goes on and as the, t the, the top six get to know one another and become uh, grow that chemistry. But right now, the best chemistry is that is that third line. What uh, uh, What's up with the squad today? Uh, off day, uh, just a little R&R mm -hmm. &R and uh, getting ready for the rest of a very busy week against some of the top teams in the National Hockey League. Yeah, I think it's fair that they had an off day today, considering they got to do back to back. They got to play Denver and then play in Vegas the next day. And Vegas, uh, you know, is up there right now. And I thought they're to me one of the more surprising positive stories in the National Hockey League right now. I, I I thought their goaltending would be a big issue for them. It is early. Um, I'm sure Gary Lawless is laughing right now because he likes to be right about everything, and uh, he's right so far about the, the <laughs> Vegas Golden Knights and their start. But don't tell him I said that, or you can't. It doesn't matter. He's going to find out eventually. But uh, yeah, goaltending has been a, a good thing for the Vegas Golden Knights. So it's a great idea to have them on off day today and get ready for that morning skate in Denver tomorrow. It's, it's a tough schedule in October, my friend. Nobody said it would be easy, uh, but here we are one-on-one -on -one after two games. No, hey, you know, in a lot of ways, a great way to dive into the season. Um, You know, yeah. you get tested by some of the best in the league. Um, You know, if things don't go well, you, you kind of learn what you need to do to, you know, keep on moving forward. And you know, of course, it'll be nice to see Bones actually get behind the bench and actually coach a game for the Winnipeg Jets after that really unfortunate uh, positive test heading into Friday. And then, uh, you know, we mentioned these two games on the road. Um, yeah. The building was pretty electric on Friday night, and you know it'll be oh, buzzing oh, Saturday. for Saturday night, <laughs> HNIC, with oh, the, the uh, dreaded it's Leafs the coming Leafs. to town. It's the Leafs. <laughs> oh, my God. It's the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> Is there more, like... Was there when I heard the booing yesterday? I'm like, buddy, leaves. Like, we heard this last year in Winnipeg. We saw like the the Vimelka show. Like we everything that was happening in Toronto last night that happened last year in Winnipeg. We we saw that story before. So I do not feel bad for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I always joke uh, when we're talking about Carl Vimelka. If you're a Jet fan or a Leaf fan watching last season, you think that this guy's the best goalie in the league. I mean, he oh, right. uh, he basically he's the best of winner. Right now, put him down. Head. Oh man, <laughs> JT, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, keep up the great work, keeping us on the, the loop on the road. Have a great couple broadcasts, and we'll look forward to seeing you and the fellas back here for that big game Saturday night at Canada Life Center against those Toronto Maple Leafs, who lost to Arizona last night at home. <laughs> No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. See you, man. See you. There it is. Uh, Jamie Thomas. You can follow him on Twitter at Jamie Thomas TV and check out all of his work on the road with the Winnipeg Jets. And of course, riding shotgun with Paul Edmonds on all the broadcasts on 680 CJOB Jets Radio. All right. Murata Tesh is going to join us in just a couple minutes. Great news, though, as we talked about with Ed Tate on the extension of Zach Caleros. And a lot of excitement building for the rest of Bomber season. One more home game, 28th against the BC Lions in the regular season. And the countdown is already on to the West Final, November 13th, IG Field. Get your tickets now. And when you go to those games, make sure you check out the Princess Auto tailgate zone before the game. Two hours before it'll open, DJ Finesse spinning. Great deals on Pop. 
Hot dogs, three fifty each. Five dollar beers right up until game time. Great prizes from the Princess Auto team as well. And the atmosphere has been phenomenal there, and it just seems to get better each and every game. Of course, Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And your friends here at Winnipeg Sports Talk and Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals and the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Check out one of two Winnipeg locations, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, and you can also shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, We couldn't do it without our friends at Culligan. We know how important hydration is and water for you and your family. And the Culligan people have been family owned as the leaders in the industry for over 65 years. They've got it all. Water softeners, reverse osmosis, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems and drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services as well. And commercial and industrial water products and solutions whatever your water needs are culligan is there for you 1200 sergeant avenue you can give them a call at 694-5180 or check them out online at drinkculligan.com and hey speaking of that bomber game coming up big cheers to our friends at canadian club for their great support of winnipeg sports talk and the blue and gold Canadian Club is the official whiskey and spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and, of course, is available throughout IG Field, as is the new ready-to-drink Canadian Club and ginger ale in cans, ready-to-drink six-packs as well at your local beer store. CC, powering the Bombers in WST, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey. Pick it up at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts and grab CC and ginger at your favorite local beer store. And uh, we will talk a little NFL at the end of the show. Andy McNamara is going to join us. Another, Well, listen, I guess the game was close at least. We did get a little bit of overtime, but a bit more dog's breakfast of a primetime game. That being said, it's always better at Boston Pizza. Last night was a great spot to be at BP, checking out the football game, keeping an eye on the Jets and the Dallas Stars. And, of course, in addition to pizza flights and beer specials on NFL game nights, You've also got the chance to win one of two trips for two to Vegas to see an NFL game and a bonus NHL game. First trip's going to be given away shortly, November 11th to 13th. Second trip, New Year's Eve weekend, where you'll see the Raiders and, of course, an NHL game on New Year's Eve as well. Watch the NFL and enter to win it. Any, any Winnipeg, Portage, Selkirk, Steinbach, Morden, Boston pizza location. All right, let's hook up with our guy Murat Tesh and get the latest uh, in his mind on uh, the start of the season for the Winnipeg Jets and a look ahead to three big-time games over the course of the next few days. Murat, what's going on? How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Life is good. Enjoying a crisp day in Winnipeg, not on the road. So, uh, you know, just breaking things down from uh, a little bit of distance with video and numbers and all that fun stuff. Yeah, well, um, been a lot to kind of get to. And, uh, you know, we're kind of rewatching some of the game this morning and, doing the same thing on the weekend. Um, I think there's been some good, um, obviously some things that need improvement on, and I don't think any of us should be surprised that that is the case, considering where they've come from with a new head coach who hasn't even been able to be on the bench through the first two games of the season. Yeah, it's interesting to know that, you know, Winnipeg at 1-1 one and one on the season, completely cromulent record, um, not getting pushed out of the arena in any game, not looking horrible or anything like that. But because they get beat yesterday on a poor special teams performance and then a few moments that just look chaotic as Dallas took over short stretches of the game, really, um, there's a sky is falling sort of feeling in the comments and on Twitter and all that sort of stuff because Winnipeg's still a little bit in shock, I think, from last year and how badly things went at the end for the Jets. I think there's been stuff to like. I think there's been stuff not to like. And it hasn't nearly been as bad as it might feel today, um, process-wise, for the Winnipeg Jets. And I think that's fine. I think that's all right, especially this week, when you look at Colorado, Vegas, and Toronto coming down the pipe. You know, I would not judge this team by its record right away. I judge it by how its process survives, um, you know, what's probably not going to be a good record this week. Yeah, um... Uh, listen, I, I said this right off the top. I saw a lot of that sky's falling narrative around after the game. And 
to be honest, I thought that was a crazy overreaction to last night's game. I thought that I thought the Jets had a great start. I thought Dallas really, you know, exerted their will over the team for a good portion of about 20 to 25 minutes in the middle of the game. Um, and, you know, I think they got a couple of breaks. I mean, when you break down the shots, the high danger chances and whatnot, I mean, this was not a complete smashing by Dallas of the Winnipeg Jets, but it does come down to a few plays. Um, you know, obviously a break here or two, some good goaltending and special teams. I mean, are you sort of where I'm at right now or am I being a little too rosy about what we saw last <laughs> night? You know, I'm pretty close, to be honest. I I have plenty of time for the argument that good teams find ways to win games. You know, I think back to that playoff run and Tampa Bay comes to mind as this team that, you know, maybe they got outplayed by Toronto. Maybe they got outplayed a couple of times during their playoff run. But they got those little moments right time and time again, those high leverage moments. And so they kept winning. And there's veteran savvy, there's confidence. And of course, there's a ton of skill that goes into that as well. I don't think Winnipeg has the swagger that comes with being a back-to-back cup champion like the Lightning were, let's say. And they don't have the swagger that comes with being a dominant top team in the league that will help them seize those individual little moments. So they're... You know, they do have a long way to go. At the same time, I'm very much with you that, you know, metrics wise, this is closer to a 50-50 type of proposition at five on five than it is Winnipeg getting beat. I think we should acknowledge that Dallas played a good hockey game. Uh, Winnipeg's start should get some credit as well. And then just I take it to the second period. Again, the second period, Winnipeg gets a couple of power play opportunities, and that's where things slow down. And um, they lose a little bit of momentum there. They um, get the inevitable makeup call. I think it was Lowry, the one that leads to the eventual goal. I know Dallas scored just after the power play had ended. Um, But that sort of seems to turn the tide for them. And for me, the concern isn't how good this team is, at least not yet. I, I don't think it's how well they've adapted to the systems, at least not yet. It's this idea that when they had their opportunities, they kind of slowed things down. That power play was tentative. And then you started to see some, you know, one of the commenters on Twitter called it Globetrotters-esque attempts from that top line, Shifley, Connor, and Ehlers that are just so skilled. And for me, for me, Huss, the overall product, pretty good. One-on-one makes sense. Uh, I wouldn't put the sky as falling by any stretch of the imagination, but it's just about that process. And they came off it a little bit in the second. I thought that they had a completely defensible game otherwise. And if you weren't traumatized by last season's collapse, you might think that it's a completely reasonable start for these Jets. Now, uh, Murat, let's talk about the uh, the blue line. And I know, and this is the common narrative, anytime bad things happen, people are all over a guy. And it's Logan Stanley's the guy that's part of the first part of the year. And um Listen, I didn't think he looked good in the goal against the, the Rangers on Friday night, and I thought there was some some semblance of chaos to his game last night. Um, and then I fire up a natural stat trick, and I look at the analytics for the game, and Logan Stanley's numbers are amongst the best in the game. Um, wh- where does the truth lie on Stan last night, and uh, what do you think happens with his spot in the lineup? Does uh, does Dylan Sandberg get the call to come in and show what he can do? Oh, against one of the best teams in the league in the defending Stanley Cup champs. <laughs> yeah, what a welcome to the league this particular season. Great opportunity to show you can hang, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, no Landeskog, but it's uh, so it's not as if they have other good players, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple. Um, yeah, I. Uh, you know what? I, I'd credit Garrett Hole for this. He pointed this out last night saying, hey, Logan Stanley's metrics are actually pretty good at five on five tonight. Um, and that that's true. That, that absolutely is true in terms of the flow of play when he was on the ice. So whenever you're dealing with a really small sample size, like a single game, like anything short of 15, 20 games is a small sample size when it comes to this stuff. You got to zoom into how the game was played. And on that third pairing, that is a place where, in an ideal circumstance, Logan Stanley can have success. He showed in his rookie season that when you shelter his minutes just right, you can get success out of the guy. So I'm not going to join the fray in piling on to him at this stage, though I will acknowledge, yes, that goal against New York, um, that didn't look good. He looked like he was caught between a couple of ideas. And from his vantage point, I think that Uh, committing to the 1v1 coverage that he was already in would have been the... But 
these are things that happen to players. And then yesterday, I think why people go come away from that game sour on Stanley is, yes, it looked like Connor Hellebuck was trying unsuccessfully to see around Stanley on the, I think that was the Hakenpa goal. Uh, so that's, you know, you'd like him to maybe push his man further away from in front of the net on that play. Um, there's a penalty issues as well that lead to goal against, to a goal against, pardon me. And so you can see these minutes or these moments where he's doing things that hurt the team in these individual frames. And that has to be acknowledged. At the same time, it's not like the puck was a hand grenade for him last night or anything to that effect either. So that has to be acknowledged. So I think you're exactly right. The truth is in between. If the flow of play is all right, let's not pretend it was awful. But at the same time, you know, that slash cost the team and that screen, I think that's going to happen when you're six foot seven as well. Um, and that's going to be a moment that sits sourly. So let's maybe not throw Logan Stanley out based on his start to the season while also acknowledging that, hey, Dylan Sandberg could be a viable alternative as soon as now. Uh, Kyle Capobianco could be as well as soon as now. Likely Sandberg wins that job this season and will deserve to. Uh, all of that sort of stuff is true, but I don't think that that makes Logan Stanley any better or worse than he was before the season began. No, and I'm with you on that. And I'll say this, if we are to believe what um, Rick Bonus said coming right out of training camp when the roster was set is that there is a continued competition for spots in the lineup and he will give other guys an opportunity to do that. And I'll say this, I don't think as much as I'm not, you know, where a lot of people are with uh, just wanting to cut the guy right now or whatever, um, I really do think that he hasn't done anything to show that he has to be in the lineup. And I think an opportunity is coming for one of those other two, most likely Dylan Sandberg. And if it does come tomorrow, Marat, it is, listen, it's trial by fire going up against a team like the Colorado Avalanche. But at the same time, it would be an incredible opportunity for Dylan Sandberg to go in, earn the confidence of the coach and basically make a statement that I can handle the Colorado avalanche. I can handle anyone in this national hockey league. And I don't, I don't want to go anywhere once I get in the lineup. I mean, that's the conversation, right? Because Winnipeg is not supposed to be a rebuilding team. It's supposed to be out. They're not a rebuilding team. They've kept all of their impact players and are trying to make the playoffs this season. So the goal is to be able to hang with a team like the Colorado avalanche Yes, you acknowledge they were the best team in the league and probably still are. But at the same time, you have to be able to play in the in those battles and against players that good if you're going to be an NHL player. And against a team that deep, there's nowhere to hide. That third pairing won't be hidden, uh, especially on the road. So it comes to a little bit of optimism with respect to the partners that Winnipeg has. This isn't a couple of seasons ago before Schmidt and Brendan Dillon arrived where if you were on the third pairing, you were probably playing with a 7-8 caliber defenseman like Lucas Spisa, Anthony Boteto, even Nathan Beaulieu for a stretch there. You're getting a veteran who has played up the lineup against good competition in the past. And no, there isn't a, a Norris Trophy winner or a dominant player to partner with. But these young players are coming into a reasonably good situation to, to show their stuff. So I think that that's, I think that's a reason maybe not to fear it. Um, and at the same time, us, when I, you know, I, I've just been thinking as, as we've been talking, this third pairing job, third pairing defensemen get beat. You don't look at a perfect season for many of these guys. But if you're giving minutes to somebody, ideally you're giving those minutes to somebody who, as they go through those growing pains, as they get beat from time to time, you know, develop the skills they need to to pursue an even higher ceiling. And we know Nathan Bolu and Lucas Pizza and Anthony Boteto and all of that, their ceiling wasn't particularly high. I think the jury split on Logan Stanley. I don't see him being a surefire top four defenseman at any point. But Dylan Sandberg could get there. And I think that's as good of a reason as any for him to be the guy, uh, especially on merit so far through this season. You know, it does crack me up that, um, you know, a good portion of uh, Jets Twitter spends 95% of the time talking about the six defensemen. Um but let's face it, it's the top four that are really going to be carrying the mail. Interested in your thoughts through two games of the uh, Demela Morrissey pairing as well as uh, uh, Neil Pionk along with Brendan Dillon? You know, I, I honestly, I think they've been okay as as a whole. There have been things that you've really liked, especially process-wise from each guy as they're trying to play the system that's being asked of them. And then there's moments of execution that you don't like. So 
I'll take it to the second period of the game against New York, where Winnipeg had been playing well. All of a sudden, the Rangers just turn on the Jets and, um, you know, uh, take it to the Jets, uh, as it were. One of the plays that really helped that happen was Nate Schmidt joining the rush. Uh, he led a transition. He joins the three forwards, and Winnipeg attacks that offensive blue line four on three or four on two. I can't remember where all of the Rangers were. This is something Winnipeg wants. If Winnipeg has numbers and control of the puck, it wants that second wave um, in the form of Nate Schmidt, the defenseman, joining the play. More op options to better odds of a scoring chance that leads to better odds of keeping the puck down there. All of that stuff is good. On that one particular play in the second period against New York, Nate Schmidt's saucer pass gets picked off, and then Winnipeg's made to defend a two-on-one. It turns into zone time and all of the rest on the ensuing uh, face-off after that. So the momentum kind of turns. So do you, you know, do you throw that play out? No, I think at this stage of the season, you want Nate Schmidt doing exactly what he did, but executing better. Similarly, Dylan DeMello, he's typically an exit pass waiting to happen. He makes the read so fast that five foot or 10 foot pass goes right where it needs to go to put a teammate in a better position. That hasn't really been a strength of his through the first two games. And that's often what helps Josh Morrissey. They have such good chemistry together and they end up with terrific metrics. Over the last few years, Josh Morrissey's best numbers have always been with Dylan DeMello playing beside him. I haven't seen that smooth exit pass from DeMello as of yet. And, you know, in a way that helped lead to that uh, a Tyler Sagan goal where he sneaks behind Pierre-Luc Dubois yesterday as well. So there are things that there are things that you don't necessarily like and you don't get the sense Winnipeg has a dominant shutdown pairing that can do it all and take over a game. But I still believe that this is a group that is capable and will have some growing pains, but will more or less be able to do a better job under new systems than it did last year. Um, overall, um, and again, we're talking about an incredibly small sample size, but it's all we've got under this new regime. Um, what have you made of just the, the stylistic changes the Jets have made and you know how effective they've been when the players, when the defensemen in particular, have been pinching, have been getting into the play, the support they've been getting from um, the forwards. I mean, has it been consistent enough for you? And um, are you seeing things that hopefully should lead to a more competitive and consistent hockey club? For me, I, I like it overall. I think that most of the time, Winnipeg's forwards backtracking and back pressure has been so good compared to last year. A much improved group um cole perfetti on the back check yesterday for example stick lift for one you've seen it from shipley you've seen it from connor you've seen it from players that you're not always used to seeing that from so that's that's the good because that sort of back checking and back pressure gives the defenseman the confidence to step up and you've seen it more and more which means that instead of two defensemen on an island and three forwards on an island with lots of space between them they're able to work together um, on offense and on defense. More options means more success as a general rule, and you like that sort of thing. But then there are moments where, and I'd say the top line's a bit particularly guilty of this, where that Globetrotters-esque feeling comes out again. And I think that the issues defensively aren't always necessarily about the back check or about the defensive zone coverage for those guys. It's a little bit more about puck management. And... When Winnipeg has come off its game, like second period in both nights and then third period last night as well, um, you've seen players try to force passes, um, you know, Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Mark Scheifele, on their way out of the zone, in transition, all of those sorts of things that can lead to turnovers. So you'd like to see that top line maybe take 10% off of the, the electric play. At the same time, they've scored a lot of points so far, so maybe you like that. I think it's about choosing times and staying consistent there. The one thing I didn't like was that in the third period last night when Winnipeg was chasing, the gap between the defensemen and forwards is really quite big. Um, there were it was it, it was most of the ice through the neutral zone between the defense and forwards. It left them to stretch passes and dump ins and all of that sort of stuff without a lot of speed. And I think that it's tough to come back in a game when that's how it looks. Um, what have you thought about the second line so far? Um, I'll say this full disclosure. I thought Wheeler had a real strong game against the uh, Rangers. Um, you know, they still wondering who like all these guys like to pass and like to set guys up and we'll, we'll see who's going to end up being the trigger guy. But, um, 
I mean, it's such an interesting line when you think about the individual stories around those three players all going into this season, all in a very different spot. Um, and the hopes are that they can be a really effective second line and maybe take advantage of some of the matchups that they'll get, you know, outside of the Lowry matchup and what the top line's getting. I mean, uh, what have you seen so far from Perfetti, Wheeler, and Dubois? Yeah, game one, I thought looked very good and still like a work in progress at the same time. You know, you have Perfetti finding Wheeler and Wheeler has a chance to go right down the pipe, but he passes it off or, um, you know, that sort of opportunity happens a couple of times. And I thought it was kind of funny that you usually expect it's going to be the young guy that's deferring to the veterans and passing up the first opportunity to shoot. It was actually Blake Wheeler more so and Pierre-Luc Dubois a little bit too. That was in my mind anyway. I mean, you know, who am I? I write, but in my mind, overpassing those plays. Um, and then you saw a good flow of shots. You saw a good bit of cycling. You saw, um, you know, a couple of nice plays where Wheeler and Dubois especially make plays off the wall or from behind the net into the slot. And then Cole Perfetti in that, um, I think that was the second period, um, just misses from the low slot. And you like the types of opportunities that they create. I think if that line stays together, Perfetti is going to need to be the shooter more than... Uh, more than maybe anticipated because uh, the space that those two guys are opening up for him. And if Dubois is able to make those low to high passes with some frequency, perfetti has got to go to those dangerous areas just like he did on that one play and then go get those shots on target. Um, last night, I thought there was a little bit less success on that front. And the interesting thing, that th it applies to the second line to be sure. It actually applies last night to every line except for the third line. Their flow of shot attempts pretty good. The amount of time they spent in each zone, pretty good. But getting those shots through, they didn't have a lot of success. And to me, that says that, you know, those battles specifically for that middle of the ice weren't necessarily being won. There was too much in their way as they were making those shots. And, you know, that's the one thing that that I wonder about is, is how they're going to turn the types of chances they got in game one into battles one. And then uh, those same chances against great defensive teams like Dallas and then finish those plays off as well. You know, one of the things, speaking of shooting the puck, and I know this was brought up, sorry, I missed it. It's a little bit back in the ch in the chat, but I mean, Rick Bonus says, one is defense to be more aggressive this year. They certainly want them to score more goals. Um, does Josh Morrissey need to shoot the puck more? I mean, hmm, does he? I, uh, I would have to sort of play the video of the opportunities, right? I mean, after two games, I'm not going to judge his, his low shot total in and of itself. Um, but then if you go into the context of the moments, then then maybe. And I think that what we've seen from Morrissey at the offensive line is he's trying to make plays. He's trying to create. Um, he's taking players on in a one-on-one -on -one sort of capacity. If you remember Tyler Myers, where he'd be at a standstill and he'd make his wide deke and he'd manage to beat the first <laughs> forward one-on-one -on -one and then, then attack the zone... Josh Morrissey's tried to do that a few times, succeeded most times, not succeeded a couple of times as well. And I think that, you know, I think that he's being encouraged to be an offensive impact defenseman from that position. And whether it's making that move, where the, whether it's getting that shot in, whether it's executing the pass that leads somebody else to get that shot in, I think you just want to see, um, you want to see that puck get to the net with consistency. And so maybe is my answer. Um, I, I don't know. We'll have to keep watching for well, that. Well, yeah, exactly. And I mean, again, these are almost unfair questions two games in, but uh, that's all we've got. And we obsess over it and the sample gets bigger and bigger. Um, that being said, the sample, as you mentioned, is going to be taken against some of the top teams in the National Hockey League. Um, this test tomorrow against Colorado, like we just had Jamie Thomas on, and I don't know that there's any building or team right now that you can play against on the road where it feels like the whole place can come crashing in on you faster. I mean, I think back to that game where the Jets had that 3 nothing lead against the Avalanche. I believe that was last season. And almost like clockwork, the second period started, and it literally was an Avalanche going one way. Um, you know, considering where this team is at and assuming they'll get Rick Bonus, um, what do they need to do? What, what What's the best-case scenario for the Jets outside of the final result of the game um, in tomorrow's matchup against Denver, considering what the goal is right now of building this team, getting it to play a way that they can handle teams like the Colorado Avalanche in their division, and really, there's no better team in the league. 
Honestly, Huss, I think I'm going to be a little bit annoying to a lot of fans for the next week or so as these games against top competition piles up. But I'm kind of with you that it's a little bit aside from the end result. I mean, you know, you, maybe Connor Hallibuck makes 42 saves and, and Winnipeg wins against the flow of play and everybody's happy that there are two points. Um, but, there's a, but there's an issue of how they're playing. For me, I think it's almost inevitable that at some point against the Colorado Avalanche, the Avalanche will take it to the Winnipeg Jets. There will be Kel McCarr attacking on the rush from the blue line. You'll have Nathan McKinnon take things over. And the thing that I want to see from the Winnipeg Jets, or that I think if you do see will bode well, is that they stick to the process that they've been taught so far. And that means, um, you know, a committing to their forecheck in whatever shape it's meant to happen, usually a 2-1-2. Two, two. Um, it means getting in on pucks when they do have an opportunity and getting them off the wall into the middle of the ice uh, as fast as they can, getting their first opportunities. It means getting that back pressure from the forwards and the defensemen stepping up and all those sorts of things. And what it definitely does not mean is those three incredible offensive players, Shifley, Connor, and Ehlers, making high-risk plays as they're trying to get out of Winnipeg's zone or enter Colorado's zone. And that's that's sort of the, the gauge I have, is everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's the Mike Tyson quote, right? And Rick Bonus has given Winnipeg a good plan, and the players have bought in, and Colorado's better than Winnipeg is. So what happens when they get pushed around a little bit? I wouldn't want to see too much of what happened in the late second and third period against Dallas where Winnipeg comes off their game, you'd want to just see them commit to the process, even if they're losing. And I would be more enthused by that than if Connor Hellebuck steals something with 44 saves. Um, speaking of saves, do you think we'll see big save Dave in these next couple of games? I imagine he'll get one of these starts this week. He has to, in my mind. I don't think you can pull any punches against the Stanley Cup champions. So I think unless Hellebuck is already tired, and I doubt that, then they'll probably go with him against Colorado. And then that makes Riddick the go-to guy against Vegas. There's so many back-to-backs in this season for Winnipeg that Riddick's game count is going to be there and it's going to be substantial. I think what we've heard from Bonus about load management, at least when it comes to the fourth line, all this other sort of stuff seems to be he doesn't want Hellebuck finishing in that 65 game range. Um, so yeah, Riddick's going to come out and he's going to be an important player and he's going to be an important player against one of these very good teams so far. Well, and, and to be honest, I mean, David Riddick had a great camp, and he certainly starred in that final preseason game, so I'm sure he's got some confidence going in, and you know they're going to need some big performances. It just The way the schedule is laid out, a lot of times the backup goalies are going into less than favorable conditions, playing on the second end of back-to-backs, and... Um, you know, a big performance or two earlier in the season and maybe stealing two points, I think would be huge for the club, would be huge for Connor Hellebuck as well. Um, and definitely you'd want to see David Riddick after a tough season last year get off to a good start in his new home here in Winnipeg. Yeah, I mean, you come out of, say, Vegas and Colorado and you manage to split somehow and you're 2-2 two and two after having played three games in four nights against this quality of competition. I think that you'd take that. I think you'd take that with... A lot of confidence if you're Winnipeg holding serves, so to speak, to give yourself an opportunity later in the year. It's a tough start for the Jets, and they're in a tough spot. So, um, yeah, you'd hope for that sort of success just so that they have something to to hang their hat on, so to speak. You know, uh, uh, Marat, obviously we're kind of getting into the minutia of two games right now. We'll have some more games to talk about next week, uh, plenty more. Um, but I just wanted to quickly um, point people out to The Athletic for your piece on Adam Lowry. And, you know, we know that Adam Lowry's been a big part of the team, um, certainly was a leader in waiting, now has the A. Um, but, you know, considering all the ugly stuff we've been hearing about Hockey Canada over the last number of weeks and months, um, pretty neat to hear a story about a guy like Adam Lowry doing what he's doing for people that are the victims here and uh, working with a great charity like that. Yeah, this is a good story. It's a nice story, especially... Just like you said, you gesture towards Hockey Canada and everything that's happening there right now. What you're looking for, maybe not looking for, because I think the microscope deserves to be on Hockey Canada right now, but you're hoping that there are positive stories out there as well. And Adam Lowry's story is a positive one. You know, it starts towards the end of last season. Mark Chipman pulls him aside and says, hey, there's this organization called the Toba Centre 
that works with children and families who've been affected by abuse in Manitoba, would you want to meet with their executive director, Christy Jikowitz, and, and, and learn more and just figure out if that's something you can get involved with? And Shipman says, well, hey, um, you know, Wheels, Wheels is so involved in stuff. Shively's so involved in stuff. Morrissey's so involved in stuff. And to hear Lowry explain that to me, I'm thinking, man, this guy was preordained for a letter. This guy was somebody that they've been looking at for a long time. Um, and then Lowry meets with the Toba Center and, and learns what they're doing for kids and families in the who have experienced abuse. And they're working together intelligently, uh, conscientiously to figure out what the best use of Lowry's skill set is. He's had a lot of meetings with them. He's lent his name and face as an ambassador for them. He's raising awareness as well. Um, and what they're looking to do with the Toba Center is get a whole bunch of the resources that kids and families need after abuse happens and put them under one roof, which I gather in that field is a particularly important thing. So kids aren't made to go from one office to a police station to medical to all these sorts of things get shuttled all over the place. Um, there's some really nice, uh, one of them actually was inspired a little bit by Sheldon Kennedy, the center that's in Calgary, these, um, these multi-pronged centers that have everything in one place and that seems to be the gold standard. And so they're pushing towards that. And it's interesting to see Lowry care so much about it. Um, obviously, it's a good cause. But to see that when you're talking to people, and it comes out in the story as well, that he's not just putting his name in face. He's asking questions. He's listening. He's definitely di digesting everything that he hears. And he's doing his best to help. And yeah, I think that's a good story. And I'm, and I'm happy that it exists. Uh, Marat, uh, before we go, uh, I'm quite excited to uh, see what you've got cooking up later on this week in The Athletic. Do you want to give us at all a teaser on uh, what might be uh, coming out or uh, just let us know when we should be looking at The Athletic? I mean, tomorrow morning, there's a piece that I worked on about Blake Wheeler for several months, to be honest, collecting stories uh, about him from people who've known him well for years and years. And I think that there's at least a few really good pieces in there that people don't know yet. And I think that's cool when there's this guy that's been around for as many years as he has, and certainly the microscope is on him as the captains he gets removed, that there are aspects to this person that we don't necessarily know yet, uh, at least publicly. So we got a lot of folks who've known him for a lot of years to confirm this, that, or the other thing, some some secret skills and events and activities and, and other sorts of stuff from his history. And I'm excited to share that one for sure. That's, that's tomorrow. That's Wednesday morning. Well, I see my guy, Les Thompson. I love Marat's personal stories of Jets players. I agree. I will look forward to be reading it tomorrow. And folks, if you don't have an athletic subscription already, what are you waiting for? Some great content from our good friend Marat on a daily basis over at the athletic Marat. Thanks so much for doing this. Look forward to the piece tomorrow. I'm sure we'll talk about it on the show and uh, enjoy these next few games. And maybe we'll see you at the rink on Saturday. Hey, sounds good, Huss. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. At WPG Marat, that is Marat Atesh of The Athletic. All right, we're going to talk a little football. Andy Mack's going to join us. It's been a minute since we've had Andy on the program. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to give a big thanks to our friends at the Nick and Nikki DQ Group. Of course, four locations. DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. Nick and Nikki have been with us since day one of Winnipeg Sports Talk, and we greatly appreciate the support. And to be perfectly honest, it's one of my favorite sponsors to support myself because it usually involves an amazing blizzard, maybe a stack burger, and uh, if I'm hungry, the barbecue, honey barbecue chicken fingers, which are my personal favorite. Pop down to any of the Nick and Nikki DQs and get your eat on. And of course, if you are having an event or a party, what goes better with partying that uh, DQ ice cream cake? They're at DQ Manitoba on Instagram. Fire them a message. Let them know what you're looking for. They'll get a beautiful custom-made DQ ice cream cake made to your liking for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. And hey, a big cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug as we get closer to Halloween and of course, the holiday season around, Little Brown Jug continues to be Winnipeg's favorite local beer. And uh, the 1919 is the signature beer, but um, they've got so many other amazing options for you. The best place to try it out is in person down at the amazing brewery and tap room on William Avenue. And it actually, it looks like we're going to get some real nice weather for the next few days. So 
pop out. They got the fire pits in the patio area. Now might be a great place to uh, hang on to a little bit more of fall with some beers outside. Of course, you can pick up great merchandise and all the Little Brown Jug beers at Little Brown Jug on William Avenue. And you can also pick up the great taste of Little Brown Jug at your local beer store. And if you want home delivery, check them out online, littlebrownjug.ca. They'll get it to you anywhere citywide. Um, all right, let's talk a little football. We've talked some Jets. We've talked Bombers and the big extension to Zach Caleros. And let's talk a little NFL after another just primetime thriller last night on Monday Night Football. Our guy Andy McNamara joins us now. Fresh back from the dog pound. How was your weekend? Hustler, every, everything up to the game Sunday was tremendous. Uh, after the game itself, second play interception to the third string tight end i knew it was going to be a long afternoon but i have to say it was great being down in cleveland my dad and i go down every year for our, our trip so we went down met up with some old friends made some new ones hit the bars and all that and uh boy that game uh it sucked much like the monday nighter much like the thursday nighter that game absolutely hey what's the uh what's the tailgating scene uh in the uh, in cleveland before the games they do it up pretty nice. good oh man i unreal uh, absolutely unreal because the stadium's right downtown, right? So you have right in the downtown walking distance from one another. You, uh, uh, you have the baseball stadium, wild game Saturday. That was fun when the when the Guardians won. That place erupted. Uh, the, I got the Rocket Mortgage House for the Cavs. And then you got the Brown Stadium right down by the water beside the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So you have tailgates and street parties all the way down, really all downtown. You got the big legendary Muni lot. You got parking lots. You got dog head uh, they, vans and all that and it's it's amazing it's one of the best tailgates and again it's everybody does it up before the game because usually they call it also they call it 1 p.m beers 4 p.m tears in cleveland <laughs> <laughs> well they don't call it the fa factory of sadness for nothing um <sighs> Uh, yeah, and listen, the game was a little bit um, not memorable. They're, the Browns are on my suspended list. I thought they were going to come in, get you a big win on the weekend. They didn't, so staying away for the Brownies no. for the next uh, for the next little bit. Was yeah. a really weird, weird week in the National Football League, and we'll get to the Chiefs and Bills in a minute and where the Bills stand at the top of the league right now, along with Philly. Um, what was what's a more concerning result? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers losing to the Pittsburgh Steelers and a combo of Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky, oh. or the Packers losing by 17 to the Jets at home, who certainly didn't light everything up offensively. I think Zach Wilson had uh, 110 yards in the air. I think it's the Packers. Hands down, the Packers have to be the most concerned. Because, you know, with the Buccaneers, you definitely shouldn't have lost that game. Don't get me wrong. I just feel they have... The pieces there and the formula to figure it out. You got the receivers, right? You got the setup. You got Tom Brady. It's week six. The guy's 45 years old. I would be shocked in another five weeks if we're not talking about them hitting their stride and going on a long playoff run. The Packers, though, Huss, they just have not been able to get in any sort of rhythm. The departure of Devontae Adams, while we knew it would be significant, I don't know if anybody thought it would collapse the entire offense. Like, you still have Aaron Rodgers. You still have your comfort toy, Randall Cobb, that you, you requested in last year. You had Christian Watson, who was a stud. He struggled. Romeo Dobbs has looked good at times. You got Tunyon, who you had nine-plus touchdowns a couple years ago. Great running backs. Why isn't it clicking? There is a real serious problem. And for the Jets, and I know they're not necessarily the easy out that we thought they'd be the whole year credit to them. You know, they're, they're gamers, but you lose at Lambeau to the Jets. Unacceptable. You better have a big meeting if you're in green Bay and figure out what the bleep is going on because don't look now, but that NFC North that you had wrapped up for how many years isn't, isn't yours right now. Well, it's the Vikings right now. And the Vikings have been, and Viking fans, maybe plug your ears. At times, been thoroughly underwhelming so far this season, yeah. and yet they've been getting the dubs when they need it. Uh, when they needed it, um, five and one on the season right now, with a head-to-head -head win over the Green Bay Packers. And you know, you look at you know their win over Miami with the 
The Packers losing one of those games on your schedule that you absolutely have to have. I mean, I haven't seen updated odds right now on the NFC North, but I'd imagine the Vikings would be an overwhelming favorite right now. And here's the thing for Minnesota. I think they can be much, much better as we go forward, Andy. And, um, you know, the start that they've had with the Lions and the Bears and the Packers in the division, I mean, there's the potential that the Vikings could run away with this. How crazy is that, right? It's not, you're not wrong at all. And the Vikings at this point don't even have to be a superstar, right? You don't don't have to be over the top. You just have to be consistent. And if you're consistent, the way the Packers are playing, commanders, you know, say what you want about Carson Wentz, better than Taylor Heineke. And the Bears Uh, are are just I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Are you you pouring yourself a Heineke? You're pouring yourself a tall Heineke? I am. Glass. And I'm starting Terry McLaurin this week because I think he's going to get the ball back again. And I actually think this is going to be good oh for the my. commander's offense. I don't know. Oh, Who, my. Well, listen, while we're talking with this, I had a conversation last night while we were watching uh, that dog of a game between the, uh, the the Broncos and the Chargers at the end after the Jets. Who Like, what is the worst possible matchup we could have right now in the National Football League? Or have we had it with the Thursday nighter last week between the Bears and the Commanders? I think we had it then. I think we had it the week before when there was zero touchdowns. When the Broncos, <laughs> the, who keep the Colts getting Broncos, who keep getting primetime games, like okay, even NFL before the season started. Like I know we like Russell Wilson to a point, but like let's not get carried away. They still have more primetime games. The Broncos are a disaster. Did you hear Melvin Gordon after the game yesterday? He's not happy. He's like oh, I thought I could have done more, but. Yeah, Melvin There's Gordon not. stinks, and if he's wondering, oh, I don't know why they didn't put me on, how about the fact that he's guaranteed to fumble once a game, usually <laughs> in a terrible, terrible situation? This, from right. a fantasy standpoint, Dusty and I hit this on the lock shop today on the Fantasy Football Extravaganza. Um, you know, it was going to be Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. Now, all of a sudden, off the street, Latavius Murray is the number one guy in Denver. Now, I would take Latavius Murray and slot him into any DraftKings lineup right now to value play. Go getting him cheaper than Melvin Gordon. Yeah, week seven, you're getting him cheaper. He's touching the ball more. And he also proved that this isn't a fluke in that he did. Remember, he came in on a, on a one spot for the Saints a couple weeks ago. He popped off pretty good there, too. Latavius Murray is one of the best value plays right now. And when you're looking at it, Hus, look at the the major players missing from fantasy football rosters this week. Okay, your season long or your DraftKings, you got to be a little creative. We're missing the Bills, the Rams, the Vikings, and the Eagles. That's some significant firepower missing. So you got to get a little creative when you're going to be filling out those lineups. Yeah, no doubt. And I'm glad you reminded me about that because I'm heavily invested in a number of those teams. Yeah, and I too. think I'm going to be playing a few real dregs uh, this weekend in uh, in the lineups. But back to the struggling teams. Um, you know, we talked about Tampa and Green Bay. This Broncos situation is frankly incredible. Now, I know, you know, we said, hey, you know, they're getting all these primetime games early on. I think part of the reason was that everyone expected this to be like a legitimate Super Bowl contender team. Never mind a team that could make some noise in a division that's been owned by the Chiefs since Andy Reid got to Kansas City. I, I, I'm not sure I can remember being more stunned by how bad a team has been. Uh, and, and listen, they got that touchdown early. They had nothing going for the rest of the way. And when you think about how decimated the Chargers are on both sides of the football, this was an eminently winnable game for the Denver Broncos. Then they get the ball twice in overtime and do nothing with it and finally take the L. Um, how how serious is this situation in Denver considering what they gave up to get Russell Wilson? Oh, and the 245 they signed up to give Russell for the next five seasons. Geno Smith is a better fantasy quarterback. And dare I say at the moment, real-life quarterback than Russell Wilson, right? That's disgusting. We shouldn't be saying that. Hey, I, you know I, what? I don't feel, Geno's I don't feel been great that. this year. I, I have, yes. I will and honest, I've made a lot of Geno Smith jokes over yeah. the years. He is making a lot of people eat their words. And I threw out with Dustin earlier today, this Russell Wilson trade could go down as the biggest larceny in the National Football League, maybe since the Herschel Walker trade, considering how things are going for Denver and what this could mean for the future right now with the Seattle Seahawks with multiple ones and twos going over in that trade. Well, here's the an interesting situation for Seattle. I think that if you put a lie detector on the Seattle Seahawks brass, 
they're probably secretly not so pleased because Geno Smith is doing better than he was supposed to. You had Geno and Drew Locke. That had tank job written all over it. Number one those pick. picks. Plus those picks. <laughs> plus the Broncos picks. Now, plus you could be looking at some weird altered universe where Seattle finishes with a better record and those Broncos picks end up being what's the prime piece. Not how bad you did. It's, it's very weird. In Denver, the head coach, Nathaniel Hackett, this guy's one and done. Guaranteed. He is out of here after he this He might year. get Urban Meyer. I'm not even sure whether he makes it till the end of year one. Like, plus maybe. Because, look, you had the, the GM had to hire a guy to help him manage the game after, like, two weeks. That's a problem. You have all the pieces around you on offense. If you take however the season's gone, you put the names down there. You look at the Denver Broncos, like, yeah, that's a playoff team. That's a playoff team that could do something. Well, why not? What's the problem? What's the issue? Right? Did Russell Wilson forget how to be good at football? I, I wager it's something more alongside the, the head coach. The game plan, whatever, isn't good, and now it's all spiral. Yeah, well, I mean, Russ is a, he's a pretty unique individual, and we've heard a lot of comments from former teammates how he somewhat put himself above the team and rubbed some guys the wrong way, and his entire act, his entire act since coming to Denver, I don't think has been, uh, has been working out. And I saw the funniest thing: it was Melvin Gordon and Jerry Judy sitting on the sidelines, and it was a picture, and they didn't look very pleased. And the quote was. Can you believe they made us, <clears throat> they banned Future from the locker room for this? So <laughs> that's a pretty funny dig at uh, Russ. I, I just, I don't know where they go from here. And, um, you know, with a game, like, you know, when you consider the games that they have lost these last couple of weeks, um, the division that they're in, how strong the AFC is, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that right now among the most disappointing teams in the National Football League is the Denver Broncos. Um you know, we don't talk often about the NFC or the AFC South. And no. I, after the first couple of weeks, I thought the Tennessee Titans might be in for a complete, you know, rebuild. And lo and behold, there's Tennessee on top of the division right now at three and two. The Colts, who have looked horrible somehow at three, two, and one. And then even if there were some good signs early, it seems like it's back to back to normal with the Jags and the Texans being at the bottom of the division. Yeah, it's it's the least sexiest of divisions. It really is. Like, okay, Tennessee's at the top. Okay. You know, that that's cool. That that's okay. Matt Ryan dialed it back though a little bit this weekend, didn't he? He's popping up three hundred through the air. You know he's that he's the good. number two passer in the NFL? That's weird. Matt Ryan has the second most passing yards in the league right now behind Josh Allen. How is that possible? That's that's that, that's that's bizarre. That is <laughs> that is bizarre. He's got some nice weapons though. You got the nice pieces. He's just not at this point working out and being that one year stopgap until the Colts figure out what their future is that they were hoping for. At least not yet. I mean, this is a bit of a turnaround. You know, it, 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 the division is there for the taking, and the Jags have lost three in a row. You're right. They look good uh, at first. There's certainly better coach. This is a, I think, find yourself year. This is a total reboot year. You have to continue to deprogram Trevor Lawrence, get him back. This is a last year was a mulligan with Herb, right? He's still passing for like what 163. I think he's going to develop better. If you're the Jags, you want to see that last quarter of the season. You're really taking those steps, win or not, mm. but just see your quarterback take those steps. And the Texans, you know what? The best thing I can say about the Texans is that Damian Pierce looks to be a good fantasy football find. He looks to be a good find, and they're going to be going with them. That's that's the best right now. Except, Hus, except they're going to be feasting off of my Browns' first round draft picks for Deshaun Watson, who's not playing. Oh, listen, the Texans are looking good for the future right now. I mean, we'll Don't see what it. happens. Blow uh, those picks. <laughs> and Pierce, <laughs> I've been giving him out as my play of the week on our prop shows, and um, he's come through every time. So I'm looking oh, forward to wow. Houston getting back on it and uh, getting him back into the lineup. Okay, how? Weird is it that, that, like, just how underwhelming the NFC South and the NFC West has been. The Atlanta Falcons and the Seattle Seahawks are both tied for first right now, and nobody has a record of better than 500. Yeah, it, it's another disaster type division, and it's a strange division. And really, you could put that NFC South right with the AFC South if it wasn't for Tom Brady. If you didn't have Tom Brady in there, there'd be no reason really to watch that division. Uh, at all. Um, I'll say this. Marcus Mariota, and I have this, I just put out on Twitter at AndyMC81, my 
week two uh, fantasy football waiver wire pickups, a couple betting picks as well. But for streamers, with the names we listed of teams being off, you're likely, a lot of you, are going to be needing some quarterback streamer help. Don't look now. Marcus Mariota, last three games, has averaged 17.27 fantasy points. Three to one touchdown to interception ratio. Last two games, 50 and 61 rushing yards. They're letting him a little loose. Uh, Marcus Mariota, you could do worse for streaming. So, you know, the Falcons are not a good team. The three and three, that's that's fine. They're just kind of waiting and, and uh, for Ritter to time to get him in. Um, the Saints are really odd because you know, Winston's hurt and Taysom Hill, they're just I don't even know what I don't even know what the plan is with the Saints Hus. It's just like Let's just get through this year and figure stuff out because Winston's not the guy because he can't be on the field. Oh, you don't think the uh, the Red Rifle, Andy uh, Andy Dalton's going to take them to the promised land? I mean, it's so wide open right now. And I think the one thing that's clear is the Giants maybe are the best story. Well, the entire NFC East. I mean, how the Cowboys have hung in there with Cooper Rush. But the five and one Giants right now, and the six and zero oh Eagles. And if you look at this Eagles schedule, like I don't know where the loss is, unless you know maybe it's something that happens inside the division. But we talk right. so much about how so many elite teams are in the AFC right now, or at least we thought going into the year. Um, it really does look like the NFCs is Phillies to lose, especially when you consider the Vikings at five and one have that one head to head loss against the Eagles. Right. And again, when you look at the two teams and how they performed, that's not an impressive five and one for the Vikings. Now you're going to take it and you're going to hope to build off it, but the Vikings, you see five and one and I put them up against the Eagles. I, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. The Eagles, this is what Jalen Hurts and us, we were talking about this a couple years ago as well. When Jalen Hurts was coming out of the draft, I was a Jalen Hurts truther before he was drafted. I said, this guy is an underrated passer of the football he start even if the stats don't necessarily reflect it. He's passing the ball better. He's running. He's not sacrificing his body unnecessarily. He's playing smart. He's got a lot of weapons around him. It's a plus a really good defense, especially the secondary. It's a it's a really well built team that is still ascending, right? Still a young quarterback. You're still ascending with Jalen Hurts. And you know I, I'll, I'll say this: that I'll be very interested with that when Dak Prescott comes back supposedly this week. Because Cooper Rush did it. People are like, oh, the, the uh, clock struck 12 on Cooper Rush. Well, yeah, but we didn't even expect the clock to start. It wasn't even supposed to be wound up with Cooper Rush. The guy kept you 4 2. You can't ask for anything more out of a backup quarterback. He did exactly what you wanted, he kept you in it. Now it's up to Dak. We'll see how that hand is to come in and get things back on track. So that, ended, that uh, I don't know if the Giants, again, 5 and 1, I'm not necessarily buying that long term nice story, but that this is still, I think, comes down to the Eagles and the Cowboys. Uh, well, in the AFC, I think many people think it's going to come down to another matchup between the Chiefs and the Bills. What was your Ooh. takeaway from uh, the big win for uh, the Mafia at Arrowhead? Uh, great game. And you know what? I was thinking if, if uh, anyone was uh, laying down some coin, you take the under on that one, right? Just those overhyped games. And it doesn't mean it was a bad game at all. Still a really good game. It was just, you know, you weren't Both of those teams have defenses. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And they're... This is a nice, fun rivalry. Like, this is what you want. You were, Like, back in the, the 80s and early 90s, right, you had the Marinos, Kosar, uh, uh, Kelly. You know, you had a, a, a size that you had a whole slew of just young quarterbacks all coming up together. And this, can you get two better guys who, as rivals with the talent than Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes? Like, those are the best of the absolute best. And they get to play each other, and they'll probably get to play each other again in the playoffs at some point. Um, and, and yeah, this is still, this is okay. You know, just like last year, Bill's got the regular season win. Chiefs got the playoffs. What happens if they meet up again? And you're right. If you look through the, the AFC, uh, who really are the contenders against that team, right? No one from the AFC North. AFC South, we talked about, no. Uh, and, and really, like even AFC West, like I, the Chargers have the pieces, but I'm they're banged up and I'm not buying them. And the Jets, okay, four and two. That that's cool, but come on, you know, let's not get carried away here. It's the Bills and the Chiefs. We thought it was going to be so competitive, and it really does seem yeah. like it's pretty much a two horse race right now. And it hopefully, is. we'll get those teams going back at it again in the That'd AFC so Championship. Just on the way out, there's been a lot of made about how shitty these primetime games have been, Andy. Uh, feast your eyes on this: the two and four Saints against the two and four Cardinals, which is far and away the best primetime game of the week. 
the Sunday nighter is the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Miami Dolphins without Tua. And the Bears are in prime time again on Monday night. Oh, why taking the on in, why? the New England Patriots with another third string quarterback. I mean, usually the oh. NFL gets it right. I don't know whether they're getting paid back for, you know, a deal with the devil or something, but these primetime games have barely been watchable. And I'm not sure these ones this weekend are going to be any better than the horrible games we've been seeing for the last two weeks. Well, has to be, again, it comes down to as well. You don't, with the bye weeks, you're missing a lot of you're missing a lot of, of, of punch, right? But the Bears, that's terrible. The Patriots, I know they beat the ba Bailey Zappi. I guarantee that's the best game he's going to have in his career, as many players do against my poor Browns. Uh, that game's going to be absolutely terrible. That's going to be what's the I'm seeing the under 39 and a half. I would smash the under. That's going to be a wretched ball game. Yeah, you're right. Steelers, Dolphins, not interested. Except I'll be rooting for the Dolphins because I hate the Steelers and Saints, Cardinals. Both those teams are train wrecks. And you know what? And you can make the case for stability that, like, which quarterback do you want to trust to just get you where you might need to be? I could argue Andy Dalton. Kyler Murray and that whole offense, people are yelling at each other, in and out of injury. Looks like Hollywood Brown's injury is not going to be as bad, but still out six weeks. And I, I don't know. It, it's going to be uh, a game that, again, at the start of the year, we thought, ah, maybe. Now, mm, you know, you'll just watch it because we like NFL football. Andy, you're the man. Thanks so much for doing this. Let's catch up again soon and uh, enjoy this week in the National Football League with a bunch of buys and a couple ugly games in Oof. prime time. And we'll do this again soon. Give him a follow on Twitter, folks, if you haven't already, at AndyMC81. Take it easy, Andy Mac. All right, brother. We'll see you next time. Good stuff. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Good old NWO sig sign off from our guy, Andy McNamara. All right. Um, let's get to, uh, let's get Remus back in here because uh, we've got a little bit more news on the Zach Caleros extension from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Uh, what's this? What are the numbers that we're hearing, Remo? A three year extension at about 600 a season, as reported by uh, Justin Dunk and uh, Derek Taylor? Oh, mute, mute, mute. Oh, man. There we go. Right back to it. So 1.8 mil, 550 yeah. guaranteed. So, so yes, yeah, 600,000 annually, uh, 250 of the $500, 500,000 the last year will be guaranteed. Um, in January, he signed a one-year extension for $500,000, 550,000 dollars. So. Um, CFL dollar amounts, not exactly the most public, but thank you, uh, Justin Dunk, for helping us out with this one. So, uh, well, and this really sets the bar for the market right now. I mean, uh, I don't think there's anyone that could justifiably walk into their team and ask for anything close to Zach Caleros, and he certainly earned it. And the fact of the matter is getting his name on a contract right now before they go for a third straight championship, probably pretty prudent work by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as well. Um, Remo, did you say we've got a clip of uh, Caleros that uh, the team's fired out that we can maybe play for the folks? Yeah, shout out to the Bombers tweeting this one out. I will fire it up right now, just saying, hey, he's pumped to, to be here for three more years. Here it is. I mean, I, I love the environment. I love the city, um, the community. But, you know, again, um, just the organization. You know, Wade, on through Ocean, the coaches, and, and just the guys in the locker room. Um, some of these guys become, you know, I think, you know, best friends to me. And uh, I think it's guys that have the same mentality and want to be here and, and try to continue on in our success. And, you know, obviously we're looking out. And that's why I don't like doing this kind of stuff. I'm looking out of the future. We have... A lot of important things ahead of us here over the next couple of weeks. But, um, again, just happy to get it done and, and to, to get, have the opportunity to be around those people uh, for a longer period of time. I mean, I, I love the environment. There's the I man. The city. There's the man, Zach Caleros, uh, speaking with the media just in the last hour or so at um, IG Field with this new three-year contract. And, I mean, like we were talking about with Ed Tate, 
I mean, the Zach Calero story with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers is, um, I mean, this is like movie material, really, when you think about it. Uh, and that doesn't even include the 29-year drought and everything that happened in this market before he got here. Um, you know, we mentioned that the groundwork was really built. The foundation of this football team was in place when he was acquired in the 2019 season. Uh, but everything that's happened since he got here has been, uh, well, I mean, fairy tale stuff. And uh, they are on the verge of doing something so incredibly special that we will be able to justifiably use the D word uh, if they get this done this year and win another great cup. And to have him sign for another three seasons after that, presumably with potentially a great cup coming to Winnipeg over the course of that, um, this could be the greatest heights in Blue Bomber history, which is saying something for some of the great teams back in the 60s, you know, with Bud Grant and not. And um, it's quite clear that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers want to keep going in this direction. And certainly Zach Caleros, who's had his greatest success as a pro here in Winnipeg, is going to keep this thing going and see just how much winning they can do as a group. It's funny you mentioned the story. I remember when the trade happened and you kind of weren't sure if he was going to be the guy. There were a lot of Questions Never mind the asked. guy even yeah. going to play. Like were, I think there was legitimate questions as to whether Zach Calero should keep going. I mean, he yes. had that horrible hit in Saskatchewan that knocked him out. He got traded. He'd had issues before. Um, and, I, I mean, as I said, I mean, I joked that said, well, you know, if they actually have to give the Argos their first-round pick, which was the conditional deal if he re-signed in Winnipeg, you knew something great had happened. Well, we couldn't have even imagined the effect that he was going to have. Yeah. I mean, never mind winning that year and then continuing it on on this, I mean, unprecedented run here is the quarterback of the Bombers. Yeah, and Peyton's asking in Chad Huss, what's the D word that Hustler doesn't want to say? It is dynasty, and I'll say it because I'm pretty sure even if you don't win a Grey Cup this year, you can already, I mean, back-to-back Grey Cups, they had the shortened pandemic, you know, the cutout season. This is a, a historically great team. And incredible that Zach Claro is going to be here for three more years. Now we're all just waiting on Mike O'Shea. But you have to think that's going to get done. You have all the pieces in place. I think the, I think those are guys that care about legacy, care about setting records, care about winning championships. And what better place to do that here? And you know Wade Miller and Kyle Walter is going to compensate them fairly for their services. Exactly. Um, but I mean, there's nothing more important than a head coach than, you know, the culture that you've built, the opportunity there and your quarterback and Mike O'Shea's got his quarterback for another three years. And, um, you know, I have no idea as to where they're at with contract extension talks with Mike, uh, with Mike O'Shea, but I'll tell you what, it sure would be nice on a, a quiet day, maybe during the bye week of the uh, first week of the playoffs, that we get a little announcement that, oh, she's going to be sticking around for another number of years. Um, great day for the Winnipeg Football Club. Bombers, of course, 14-3, and three, booked for the West Final at IG Field on November 13th. I know tickets going very well for that. Grab them if you haven't already. Uh, all right, let's get to some cool bet lines for tonight. And Rewa, I just realized we got a baseball game starting in about 10 minutes or so. The postponed game five between the Guardians and Yankees. Um, this is a do or die game for both teams. Going to be pretty awesome. Yankees, no doubt the favorite, minus 172. But that pesky Cleveland team hanging in there, plus 152. What do you think? Go with the underdogs. Screw the Yankees. I'm not, I'm not betting on them. However, they are at home. This is just such a funky time. Uh, Perfect time, Huss, for a, uh, yes, winner go home deciding game. Four o'clock on a Tuesday. Uh, I guess they did get rained out last night. Not entirely their fault. I will, I'll go with, uh, with Cleveland here, Huss. Take the underdog. I would love it. I would love it. And then a little later on, we get the NLCS <laughs> to begin. Oh. Who had the Phillies and the Padres playing each other for a trip to the World Series? Not me. San Diego, minus 118 favorites. And the Phillies, plus 104 in game number one of their best of seven. Series pricing is San Diego, minus 120. And the Fightin' Phils, plus 107. Um, elsewhere, what do we got in the National Hockey League tonight? We actually got a pretty big slate of Starting with the Vancouver Canucks in Columbus to take on the Blue Jackets. Columbus minus 105, Vancouver minus 112. 
Did the did the Canucks get their win tonight, Remo? Will the players only meeting have the desired effect on uh, the team from the West Coast? Uh, they're on a back to back. It's tough. I did see, even though uh, Blue Jackets are slight favorite, those basically pick them. Uh, Money Puck did have the Canucks as favorites, but I'm going with with the Blue Jackets here. Uh, there's a lot of teams on back to backs, us where you could do like a nice parlay of teams who are the rested teams, like if you did. Blue Jackets, Devils against the Ducks. I don't get so Senators against Senators. the Bruins. There's one more. Um, oh, Predators against the Kings would be the other one. So that would be. Those are all. Those are all favorites against teams. Uh, the rested teams against the teams who played last night. Interesting one to look at. Couple other uh, matchups. Interesting one in Calgary. Golden Knights at mm-hmm. Flames. Flames minus one fifty two at home. Vegas plus one twenty nine. The Buffalo Sabres plus 200 in Edmonton to take on the Oilers, who are a big favorite. And yeah, as you mentioned, uh, the Kings who had that OT win last night in Detroit, now in Nashville to take on the Predators. Kings plus 144 and the Preds minus 169. The, not, the line's already out for tomorrow's Jets Avs game. And uh, as you would imagine, the Jets are a significant underdog plus 200, Avalanche minus 250 for the game tomorrow. Head on over to Cool Bet, folks. Use the promo code WST if you haven't played a Cool Bet before. We'll hit you up with a 100% bonus on your first deposit, up to 200 bucks. And for you, for you fantasy footballers out there, Dustin Nielsen and I cranked out our uh, fantasy football extravaganza edition of the Lock Shop earlier today. So check that out on uh, my Twitter feed, Dusty's Twitter feed, and make sure you're subscribing to The Lock Shop wherever you get your favorite podcast. What's going on tonight, Remo? Uh, I'm getting on the ice playing hockey, but probably doing a DraftKings lineup and watching my teams. I might also, I don't know, I'm always editing videos late at night for um, Winnipeg Sports Talk. So, you know, make sure you check the channel, hit the subscribe, turn on the notification bell. There was one that came out this morning, just you and Ted. You know, you and Ted yesterday talking with the Bombers, uh, lost to BC and just where they stand at the bye. However, I posted that. I had it auto posted at like 8.30. And then the Caleros news came <laughs> out this morning. So kind of, it's not totally expired, but uh, it's tough. I like to, you know, package whatever Jets content as a post. And it's just really hard to do that, you know, after, I don't know, game day. So uh, stay tuned to the channel. Though. I'll post the Marat one separately. Um, that you guys had a great discussion earlier. You got it. And of course, if you missed um, right off the top of the show, about 10 minutes in, Eddie Tate jumped on to talk about the significance of the Zach Caleros extension. It was a great conversation as well. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for us, gang. We will be back tomorrow. Give you a bit of an idea about what's coming up the rest of the week right now. Uh, we are absolutely packed. Tomorrow, um, Scott Billick and Mike McIntyre will join us from Denver and we'll stay in Denver actually. And a good friend of mine, Will Peterson, who's with 1043, the fan in Denver, will uh, give us a little insight into the Stanley Cup champs. And I may have to ask him about the Broncos too. Somewhat looking forward to that. Gary Lawless and Ken Weeb join us on Thursday before the game in Vegas. And uh, we'll have a big Friday show getting ready for the Leaf game. Brandon Rewicki, Lee Hacksaw, Hamilton, and uh, working on a couple of other special guests to jump on in the next couple days as well. Folks, thanks so much. If you haven't already, make sure you've hit that red subscribe button on YouTube and make sure you've subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We will be back tomorrow to set up the Jets and Avalanche in Denver with a uh, great group of guests, the latest on the Blue Bombers on this bye week, more followed from the Zach Caleros extension, and uh, maybe a little bit more of a look ahead to the next week in the National Football League. And, of course, we'll know the ALCS after this Yankees-Guardians game finishes up a little later on today. We'll hit it all tomorrow. Thanks so much for being with us. Tell a friend about Winnipeg Sports Talk, where they can find us, and how they can subscribe for free to the content. And we'll see you tomorrow right here on WST. Have a great one, folks. Oh, my God! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.